Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world and whenever you are watching this. My name is Christian Richard, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dynavis 2021, the third international workshop on dynamic scene reconstruction. Let me start by introducing my fellow organizers of this workshop. Marco Willino is at the University of Surrey in the UK. Armin Mustafa is also at the University of Surrey. Dan Casas is at the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in Spain. Myself, Christian Richard, I'm at the University of Bath in the UK. Michael Solhofer is at Facebook Reality Labs Research in the United States. And Adrian Hilton is also at the University of Surrey in the UK. This workshop aims to bring together leading experts in dynamic scene reconstruction and to create and maintain a database of data sets and publications to accelerate the research progress in the dynamically growing field of dynamic scene reconstruction. So we are collecting and curating a website of data sets that you can find on our workshop website, collecting all the data sets we can find on um, dynamic humans, dressed humans, fully dynamic scenes. And if you are missing any of the data sets that uh, you are publishing, for example, or that you've come across and use in your own work, please do reach out to us and we will be happy to add this uh, data set to our website. Let me introduce you to how this workshop will uh, pan out, hopefully. So we are live streaming to YouTube right now. We will have some live keynotes and pre-recorded talks, and we will accept questions to the talks and the keynotes via the YouTube chat. So please use that if you have any questions that you would like to ask to our keynote speakers and presenters. And finally, these talks will also be recorded and available uh, in the future on YouTube. Here's the program for today. So we're starting already off with a welcome and introduction session. We will follow this with a keynote by Lourdes Agapito and have a, a paper session with nine exciting papers, sorry, five exciting papers. Uh, we will then have a little break in the middle and uh, follow this up with the second keynote for our workshop by Howard Lee. We will close out the workshop with a panel discussion between paper presenters, uh, workshop co-organizers and our keynote speakers, and then present the best paper award at the very end. I already hinted at our keynote speakers. We will have two keynotes. Uh, the first uh, keynote is by Lourdes Agapito, a professor of 3D vision at University College London. And our second keynote is by Howie Lee, the CEO and co-founder of Pin Screen Incorporated and a distinguished fellow at the um, University of California at Berkeley. We have uh, five exciting paper presentations for you today on dynamic appearance modeling from minimal cameras, consistent 3D human shape from repeatable action, Temporal consistency loss for high resolution textured and closed 3D human reconstruction from monocular video. Super resolution appearance transfer for 4D human performances. And we have an invited talk of a paper to appear at SIGGRAPH 2021 later this year on editable free viewpoint video using a layered neural representation. At the end of the workshop, as I mentioned, we will present the best paper award to the first four, uh, among the first four uh, presenters. And with that, I'm handing over to Dan, who will be introducing our first keynote speaker. Dan, please take it away. So our first keynote speaker is Lourdes Agapito. She's a professor of uh, 3D vision at the University College London, UCL, where she leads the research group that focuses on 3D dynamic scene understanding from video. Lourdes has, many, uh, has published many seminal works on many areas related to 3D scene understanding, including uh, non-rigid structure from motion, dense optical flow estimation, 3D reconstruction of deformable and articulated structures, and 3D modeling of non-rigid dynamic scenes. So honestly, I cannot think of a better keynote speaker for a workshop that is titled Dynamic 3D Scene uh, Reconstruction. Um, her fundamental contributions in this area have led her to many grants, awards, and invitations to keynote speakers, including an ERC starting ground uh, starting in 2008, uh, that's, that's a while ago, but she's uh, been recently a keynote speaker at ICLR. Uh, recently, she's also very successful in the industry too. In, in 2017, she was co-founded uh, the company called Synthesia, where she, that offers content creation tools that include video synthesis. So I'm really excited to hear about her uh, keynotes. So Lourdes, let's go ahead and hopefully the internet is now okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, 
Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for, for your, your nice introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about learning 3D representations uh, of shape and also of deformations. Um, so this area of, of learning 3D representations is, as Dan said, something that I've been working on for, for many years now, um, for about 25 years. Um, and I, I think what I would like to focus on today is to try and offer a perspective of, of how, um, how we've been going on about solving these problems and how important in particular machine learning has, has been um, to solve these problems. Um, so, sorry, okay. Um, so we're, we're all very used to seeing busy scenes like this, which uh, in principle might look very chaotic, but we can make, um, we can make very good understanding ourselves of what's going on in this scene in 3D. Um, it's easy for us to understand, um, you know, partially because of perspective, you know, what's, what's close to us, what's far away, what's the structure of, of this particular market and this particular road. Um, but a lot of the understanding that we actually get in, in 3D is actually due to the fact that we have a lot of prior knowledge. So we have a lot of prior knowledge about uh, what humans look like, what their 3D poses uh, would be like, how far someone would have to reach to pick up one of the fruits in the stalls, um, what shapes the objects would have, uh, their color, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so we, we use so much prior knowledge here that, that you know, we, we think that this 3D understa understanding problem uh, would be a perfect task um, to use machine learning. Um, but when we look at the very large computer vision data sets that have been collected over the years uh, for image recognition and for detection, it turns out that they, they only really have 2D annotations. Um, so annotations such as class labels, masks, and uh, key points. Um, and what we, what we don't have is aligned uh, 3D shapes with these, with these images. And so although in, in recent years, there have been very important efforts in, in collecting uh, 3D data sets that are aligned with images such as ScanNet or ShapeNet or, or Matterport, um, so they're either synthetic, like, like ShapeNet, or they are usually you know, indoor scenes. They're incredibly uh, expensive to, uh, to acquire, and they're very difficult to annotate. It's still um, extremely difficult to annotate. Um, so, you know, therefore, the easy way to go about this problem, which would be to use a fully supervised model where we have uh, 3D labels for all of our images, um, this approach is, is completely out of the question. Um, but it, it just turns out that this problem of 3D reconstruction from weak annotations or, or even directly from images is uh, without any 3D labels is something that, that we've been working on for many years and so, something that the 3D community has a lot of experience on. So if we look at old school methods, um, you know, these geometric methods that were very popular in the 1990s and then in the 2000s, um, in essence, these are self-supervised methods really. Um, so one of the big successes of, of the era of, of, of geometric computer vision was structure from motion, this problem that we see represented here. And the idea there is that we have just a collection of images, uh, no more information about them, and what we want to do is to build a 3D scene representation where you know, that representation might be a collection of 3D coordinates and the camera poses that generated the images such that when we project or when we render those observations back onto the images, um, we, we get back the images that, that we started off with. So we get back our 2D observations. So you know, the loss that we're using here is, is a 2D loss. We don't have any 3D losses in, 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 we're not using any 3D losses in solving this structure from motion problem. Um, so you know, this, is, this is something that we've, uh, that we've taken uh, a lot of inspiration from, the, the 3D community has. Uh, another example is multi-view stereo. So here the observations are the images themselves, right? And the problem that we want to solve is, can we reconstruct a, 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 a dense 3D mesh 
uh, such that when we render it back onto the images, we synthesize back our observation. So, you know, it's this analysis by synthesis uh, way of solving the problem. And to do this, we use a photometric loss to guide the estimation of the depth of each point such that when we render back, we see back the original images. So there are no 3D annotations here either. Um, and these two examples that I've chosen, um, the inference of the parameters uh, is actually uh, done via optimization. And you can see that the 3D representation might be, might be a mesh of a, a kind of a classical, rep, a classical representation. Um, but you know, this, this actual scheme works incredibly well also with maybe more modern representations. So you could think of the green box. We can now, you know, in, in 2021, we're starting to build neural representations. So can we build neural networks that encapsulate the 3D information? Um, in the rendering part, um, you know, now that we can, we can do uh, differentiable rendering, um, we can embed this as well within a neural network and we can render back the images, get the gradients, and therefore all of this can actually be very easily incorporated into, um, into a deep learning uh, way of, of solving the problem. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, very, this is very exciting. Um, and I mean, of course, it hasn't been trivial. trivial. It's taken many years for us to, to work out, you know, how to build these neural scene representations, how to do neural rendering, how to embed all this within, within this uh, deep learning approach. Um, but, you know, I think the sense that I want to give you here is that multi-view consistency is, is actually what's still driving um, uh, re reconstructing dynamic scenes and reconstructing scenes in general. Um, you know, now we, we're using more powerful methods, both for representation and for inference. Um, but, you know, underlying everything, we're always looking for this multi-view consistency. Um, so, of course, you know, now there are many, many different things that come into play. Which 3D representation do we use? Um, and as I said before, we can go for more traditional representations, such as voxels, point clouds, or meshes. Um, or we can even use neural networks that will represent uh, the properties of, of 3D points. Um, we also need to think about image formation models. Um, so the image formation model is going to have a few different factors that, that are important. Of course, geometry, uh, viewpoint, material, and lighting. And we might actually, for instance, ignore uh, lighting for some of our applications, or we might actually not want to have a full model of, of what the materials are like and just stick to, say, Lambertian um, surfaces. Um, so, you know, the image formation models is also, we can play with, uh, with how, um, how detailed they are. Um, we also, of course, can decide what observations we use. We can, um, we can use key points, we can use um, silhouettes, uh, we can use the full image. So, you know, we have, we have a, a, a large variety of different observations that we can use uh, for our losses. And as I've said before, really, um, you know, to try to avoid having to use uh, strong annotations, um, typically we're going to look for either 2D annotations such as silhouettes or key points, or we want to go completely um, self-supervised. But so far, I've, I've just talked about capturing a static world. Um, but in the cases that we are most interested in, particularly those of us attending this workshop, um, what we want to learn is 3D representations that can explain not just a single instant in time, um, but that they can represent any possible deformation and configuration of, of a specific shape, in this case of, of a subject. Um, and this is really the, the main topic of my research, learning these 3D demorphable, uh, 3D morphable uh, models or deformable models that can explain the variations of uh, shapes um, through time, for instance, in the case of a, of a face um, or in the case of a body, or even explaining how uh, the, the, the variations of shapes across a category, in, if we think about you know, the category of, of cars or chairs, how the shape varies across the category can also be seen as you know, 
um, deformations, in fact. And what we're most interested in is how to learn these directly from images. Um, and so, you know, there's, this brings in one more element. If we just use the analysis by synthesis method that I showed you before and use for this geometric consistency, because the shape is changing over time, um, then of course, you know, that, that will lead to many ambiguities. There could be many different 3D shapes that could render, that could give back the same observations when we render them back. So in the case of deformations, we need to start thinking about a 3D representation that can encapsulate uh, priors, can encapsulate some prior information about the deformations across categories of objects. So typically these tend to be pre-trained uh, from thousands of 3D scans. Um, some of these representations are parametric, as you can see here, like 3D morphable models, such as the model from Lance and, and, and Vetter, uh, for the faces uh, that encapsulate the deformations of, of the shape and also the variation of the, of the appearance. Um, or for instance, the, the simple model, a parametric model for expressing the deformations of, of bodies. Um, so all of these need to be trained in advance and they're trained with, with you know, many, um, we, with many examples, with uh, many three, thousands and thousands of 3D scans. Um, Another way to represent uh, the variation of shapes across a category, for instance, these days is, is to use uh, deep shape priors, such as deep SDF the, uh, that you can see here. So this is a neural representation, in fact, where the deformations or the variations of the, of the shape are actually captured inside a, a, a neural network. Um, so all of, all of this is great. So if we have all of these uh, pre-trained um, shape priors or, or 3D models. Um, at inference time, we then typically what we do is that we get some images and we're trying to fit the parameters of the model to our 2D observations. Um, but really, you know, what's quite important, I think, in from uh, my point of view, is to actually think about how could we solve this uh, jointly? How could we actually learn these priors from images directly so that we don't have to go through this 3D capture process, um, which is very expensive and it's, it's difficult because it needs aligning all of, all of the objects. So how can we learn these priors directly from images without the need uh, for any 3D data? And um, I just want to go back to this work that now you know, seems fairly, fairly old, um, it's from CVPR 13, um, but this is exactly what we did in this work from, from CVPR. Um, so we had a, a sequence of images. This was the first uh, monocular system uh, where we could reconstruct uh, a deformable uh, 3D shape just from an, an image sequence without having any, uh, any pre-learned priors. So we didn't use any 3D morphable models. Um, and what we want is to reconstruct a, a, a dense model. Um, so you can see here that uh, we're reconstructing a dense model for every frame of the sequence. So our observations in this case um, are, so we take the original video and we track all of the pixels in the image over the sequence uh, using uh, a, an adaptation of, of an optical flow method. So our observations are the 2D point trajectories over time. So for every point, we know where it went in every single frame. And what we want to do is to reconstruct a model such that when we project back um, the mesh onto the image, we get our observations back. So the 3D points are going to reproject back onto these tracks that, that we had tracked before. But of course, this is not enough. Uh, there would be an infinite numbers, number of possible shapes that could reproject onto the same measurements. We need to add a prior. And the prior in this case is that if we take all of these shapes from the entire sequence, they actually lie in a low dimensional embedding. And we impose this by minimizing the trace norm. So we kind of say, you know, we could explain all of the shapes with a very small number of components. Um, and these components here, K are, it, that, that number is much, much smaller than the number of frames. Um, so you can see here how 
you know, what we're really trying to do is, is, is to look for, for an embedding um, that can explain all of the deformations, but we want that embedding to be very low dimensional. So essentially what we're saying is that the shape at each frame can be explained as a linear combination of a ba some basis uh, shapes. Of course, these shapes are unknown. This is what we have to learn. We have to learn this, this uh, embedding space at the same time as which we, we learn to, to reconstruct um, every, uh, every frame. So we take all of these frames, including also a spatial smoothness prior uh, to promote smooth surfaces and we, and we optimize. So of course our loss is 2D as you can see here, this reprojection error. And our final re representation is a low rank embedding that can explain all of the frames in the sequence. And it's been learned purely from images. So here are some of the results on face reconstruction. Um, and yes, you know, they're, they're now quite old, these, uh, these results. But what was exciting at the time, and I think even, exa even exciting now, um, is that um, with this, this was actually, um, we were learning the priors, we were learning this low rank representation at the same time uh, as, as we were optimizing the shapes in the sequence. The other exciting thing is that, of course, because we, we didn't have a, a pre-trained embedding, this was the embedding we were learning at the same time, then of course we could, um, we, you know, we could apply it to any kind of, uh, any, any kind of, of data. So it was completely agnostic of, of the objects that, that we were looking at. Um, so you know, this, is, this is quite exciting. Um, so, you know, we also, uh, we also did some follow-up work um, in which um, what we did was instead of doing this pre-tracking of, of, the, of the optical flow, um, we jointly optimized the correspondences over time in the sequence um, and also the reconstruction. And here, the idea is to drive everything with a photometric loss instead of splitting up the tracking first uh, using optical flow and then the reconstruction using the tracks. So the idea is that we had a, a template and we were trying to estimate a, a dense deformation field, a 3D deformation field, so a 3D vector for every vertex on the mesh, such that when we deformed um, the object using that deformation field and we rendered it back onto the image via also the, the estimated camera pose, then we would get an image and compare it with a current live frame. And using a photometric loss, um, then we could reconstruct, uh, we, we could estimate the, this, um, this deformation field, the 3D deformation field. Again, we need some priors. And in this case, we used some local smoothness priors. So we used um, as rigid as possible, ARAP, it's a, it's a prior that's still used very, very extensively in the community. Um, so uh, locally, we, we think that, you know, we, we impose that um, surfaces will, will behave as, as a rigid, uh, as, as they, they will have rigid deformations. Um, and the other thing that we use is a total variation, um, prior that tells us that uh, that spatially uh, surfaces are, are smooth so it preserves um, spatial smoothness and um, you know again this is the quality of the reconstructions that we could get um, and the nice thing again is that um, you know we you can see that we can we can use it we can jointly track and reconstruct the shape using photometric losses and we can use it on a on a variety of, of different objects so you can see a face and a few different objects here, because again, we're not using any, any specific pre-learned priors, we're learning these priors as, as we go. And, um, and of course, this is nice when we're looking at objects for which we don't have enough 3D training data to pre-train a prior, but in some cases, such as faces, um, we do actually have these 3D models, so 3D morphable models. Um, so, you know, it's very useful to actually use these models for, for tracking. So the idea is the same, estimate the model parameter such that we, when you resynthesize the images, we get back um, the same observations. And, um, you know, there's been 
uh, an immense amount of work uh, from you know, many of our colleagues in, in the community in doing this inference also you know, in real time. Um, and the, the, the nice thing is that um, if we're able to do this tracking very accurately, um, you know, it does actually work incredibly well. So when we resynthesize the observations using the estimated model that you can see um, shown in, in yellow here, the errors are, are really, really small when we compare with the original image, right? So we're really able to re-render the original image very well. Um, and the fact that we're modeling the face accurately in 3D means that we can later edit these parameters to resynthesize new movements of the face or new lip motions, for instance. And this is exactly what we do in, in, in our company, um, Synthesia, that we, we started um, a few years ago. Um, so we started off by uh, tracking two different actors and transferring the motion from one actor uh, to the next. Um, but at the moment, we are now at the point where we can go um, directly uh, from text to video. So we can, um, we can type um, some text and we can infer the lip motion directly uh, from the text. Um, and then you know, we can then generate the 3D lip motion parameters directly um, from the speech so we can just type this text and then generate a video that's saying exactly what we what we put here. Um, so, you know, you can all go to our website and you you can try this. I've just made a little clip which probably won't play very well over Zoom, but I'll, I'll still try. I'm excited to be here to demonstrate how Synthesia allows you to make videos simply by typing text. The reason it works so well is that my face is modeled in 3D. Okay, so, so this, is, this is actually really true. I mean, the, the, the reason why this technology works so incredibly well is that um, the, 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 the synthesis process, um, you know, using, of course, we're using GANs here for the synthesis, um, it, it's 3D driven. So we have 3D models for, for, for our avatars and our faces, um, and therefore, you know, the quality of the, of the synthesis is, is incredibly high. I mean Okay, so, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, human pose uh, estimation from, from a single image. Um, so we've, you know, we've looked at faces um, and uh, here the motivation is, is exactly the same. So we want, to, uh, we want to have images as input and what we want to do is to uh, generate or to locate the, the joints, uh, the, the joints of, the, of the person in 2D and also at the same time uh, reconstruct in 3D. Um, and the idea is that we actually want to solve both tasks simultaneously. And what we want to do is not to have images that have 3D annotations. We don't want to need 3D annotations for our images. So we have two, um, two separate data sets, um, two completely decoupled data sets. Um, they're independent. We've got a bunch of images or many images with uh, 2D annotations. And then completely separately, we've got a large corpus of 3D mocap data. And uh, in this case, what we do is that we take the 3D mocap data and we learn uh, a 3D model. Um, so we learn, um, we learn a, 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 3D, um, a 3D morphable model that's actually um, it's encapsulating the deformations of the, the, the deformations of the body. So it's actually a, a mixture of PPCA models. Um, and I'm not going to go into, into details about how we build the, the model, but the idea is that we take the, the mocap data. First of all, we have to pre-align all of the data, and then we learn this model such that then, you know, when we have uh, when we have an image, if we can locate the 2D poses, we can then do this kind of analysis by synthesis approach where we can then reconstruct the skeleton in 3D by estimating the actual parameters of the model for that particular image, for that particular pose. Um, so then what we can do is that we can then embed this within, um, within a, a deep learning approach. So how does this work? Um, so we 
feed images as input. And um, you know, first of all, we have some convolutional layers that are trying to predict uh, the, the, the positions of the, of, the, uh, of the joints in 2D. And here, you know, we would have a 2D loss. Um, and this, is, this could be any 2D predictor, right? So we could take some, some layers that, that are actually trying to predict um, the belief maps of where the, uh, the 2D joints are located. Um, but we go a bit beyond this. And what we do is we say, now taking this predicted belief maps, what we can do is that we can lift our skeletons into 3D. We can project them back onto the image again. And then um, our loss is going to be, so we're going to fuse the predicted belief maps that come from the convolutional layers and those that have been lifted into 3D and projected back onto, 3D, uh, onto 2D. And that's where we're going to have our loss. So our loss is, is 2D, it's, it's not 3D. Um, and it's, 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 actually, um, it's actually infusing this, this 3D prior into the estimation of the, of the 2D joints. Um, so now something else that we did later was that what you can do is, is even uh, have a self-supervised approach where we don't even need those 2D annotations. So we can compare the predicted belief maps and then the predicted belief maps by the, by the 3D model. And we can compare these two and that's what our loss is going to be. And the nice thing is that by having this self-supervised approach, we can then deal with human pose estimation um, completely in the wild. And this, this is actually very exciting. So the idea is that you know, we can perhaps you know, pre-train a little bit our network on a set of images for which we do have some 2D annotations. But then if we have new sequences such as these ones that are very challenging because they're in very difficult environments, we perhaps don't even have any 2D annotations, we can then use this corpus of, of new annotations or that, that are just the videos themselves. We can add these videos to, to, the, um, to the training and then we can, uh, we can improve the network and we can reconstruct 3D poses for you know, very, very difficult environments such as, such as this one here. So that's really the benefit of being able to you know, to have weak annotations, but then also a self-supervised method that will help us uh, improve even more. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a CVPR paper that we have this year in collaboration with the University of Surrey. Uh, Armin Mustafa has been the, the, the leading author in this work. Um, and uh, here we're trying to solve the problem of multi-person reconstruction from a single image. So the idea is that we have a single image with multiple occluded people, and we want to infer detailed and spatially coherent uh, reconstructions of humans in a 3D scene. So the two important things here is that we don't want to use a model um, such that you know, we lose all the details about the clothing, uh, and we want to be able to reconstruct uh, each, of the, uh, each of the humans individually, but then also compose the, the scene in a, in a coherent way. Um, so the important thing here is that we have to solve two problems. We have to solve the accurate spatial arrangement between all the different people in the scene. And we also want to do a detailed model-free implicit reconstruction that can capture details about, for instance, the clothing, etc. If you compare with previous approaches, they've been mostly uh, model-based, as you can see here, Vibe and Fosa, and um, they actually use the simple model and the simple model is not going to capture any details about, um, about the, the, uh, the clothing, for instance. Um, so we've provided a, a 3D data set of multi-person scenes with interperson occlusions, realistic clothing, uh, changes in hair poses, scenes, illumination, uh, which we've made uh, publicly available. And then we've trained an end-to-end -end learning framework. And um, perhaps what's, what's uh, exciting about this, about this framework, first of all, is it's end-to-end. It's -end. Um, but um, the, other, the other interesting thing is that, um, is that we're solving these two problems, the problem of uh, high resolution 3D reconstruction with, the, with details of, of the clothing, 
Um, and also we're estimating the six DOF poses of, of each of the people. Um, so to solve the, the, the reconstruction of the humans, we first of all go through a voxelized 3D estimation network that's going to give us like a voxel uh, representation, which is more like a coarse representation. It doesn't capture all of the geometry and all the, all the details. And with that, we generate some features. And the nice thing is our, our, our network has an intermediate representation where we're generating features from three uh, different sources. This voxel features, we, have, we st also use the image. We have an image encoder that gives us some, uh, some features. And we also estimate depth. Um, and we also generate some features that, that come from, from the depth. And then by combining these features, we can get this high resolution 3D reconstruction. Um, for uh, the pose estimation, we combine an intermediate representation that has uh, knowledge about instant segmentation and also about the, about the depth. Um, and if we put everything together, so here's some, some results on, on, on some individual images. Uh, so you can see here that, you know, there's multiple people. And what's really interesting is that we can really recover the six off pose of the, of the people um, accurately, not just their shape, but also exactly where they were, where they are in the image, in the, in the 3D scene, sorry. Um, and the, the, the layout, the complete layout of the, of the scene. Um, perhaps, you know, more, more interesting are, are the videos. You can see here quite a challenging video uh, with two humans um, coming together and, uh, and you can see that the, 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 the reconstruction here, for instance, where there are also uh, more occlusions, it's, it's, a, it's a, a good quality reconstruction. Here you can see more occlusions and you can see that the reconstruction is actually achieved nicely. So th there's no time consistency here. Um, there's, um, you know, there, there's, uh, it, it's just reconstruction from a single image. So, you know, there's still, there's still more, more exciting uh, work to do. Um, okay, so uh, the next topic I wanted to cover is, is, uh, is, is looking at, at scenes, at complete scenes and uh, reconstructing uh, object-aware representations uh, of the world. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested also in, um, in, in SLAM, so in um, simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, and we want to represent scenes, but not just the geometry. We actually want to have an idea of scenes at the level of objects, represent um, different objects. Um, and, uh, and, and to, to actually know the object category that they belong to, uh, as well as you know, their geometry. So the trick here is to combine 3D reconstruction with 2D detectors and 2D semantic masks and to transfer these semantic labels onto the 3D model in, in a consistent manner over time. And what you can see here is that you know, by representing each of the objects independently, we we can also handle dynamic scenes. You can see here that a person is actually picking up the bottle and the bottle is being moved around. And we can do this because we are representing uh, the scene as a, as a dynamic uh, graph of objects. The objects don't have to be static. They can actually, they can actually move and we can continue uh, to track them and reconstruct them over time. So, what you can see on the left is, is, is some work that, that we did uh, in, in 2018, uh, mask fusion. And here we were reconstructing each of the objects based on the uh, RGBD data that, that, we were, that we were capturing. We weren't using any, any priors, no, no prior information at all. So how can we actually move to the, to the, to the right, to, to the work that you can see on the right. This is work from CBPR last year, um, Frodo from Detections to Objects, um, where we want to actually reconstruct, uh, we want to reconstruct full shapes. We want to reconstruct each object as a complete shape, even when we have partial observations. So the big difference here is that on the left, you can see that we can only reconstruct uh, the, 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 the part of the object that, that is visible, uh, but if we use the power of, of shape priors, then we can, we can complete parts of the object that are actually not, not visible. 
Um, and to do this, uh, we use a pre-learned 3D shape prior for each object, um, for each object in the category. And uh, in this case, we take advantage of um, we take advantage of, of deep SDF. So the representation you can see here at the bottom. The idea is that you can feed a 3D point location to a uh, to an MLP, and it returns it it learns the uh, the, the SDF value, uh, so the distance of that point uh, to the surface. Um, and this representation is trained directly from 3D data. Um, so the idea is that you have a bunch of objects from the same category, um, and then at, uh, at training time, what you do is you're learning two different things. You're learning uh, a decoder that's going to be able to uh, Given a given an, an XYZ position and given a latent code that represents a particular shape, it's going to be able to output the SDF values for all of the points uh, on the shape. And at the same time, we're also learning uh, an embedding, a 3D representation uh, that's going to encapsulate each embedding is going to represent the shape uh, of, of an object in, in that category. And then at inference time, uh, there's an optimization. So uh, you fix completely the, the parameters of, of the decoder, and then you infer the, the shape code um, that actually represents the, the, the shape or the, the geometry of the, of the shape uh, that we want to represent. Um, so you know, this is, uh, so this is deep SDF that was presented at CVPR 2019, and at inference time, uh, the idea is you have an incomplete point cloud and then you can infer or you, you do inference, um, you do this inference time optimization to obtain the latent code. So in some ways, um, the question that we were, uh, see, here, here's a, a video that, that just shows you the, the, um, the embedding and some, some different latent codes. So, the question we asked ourselves was, could we estimate these shape code vectors just from images without needing any 3D data? So this was what, what we were really interested in, in trying to solve. Um, and then the idea is to follow this analysis by synthesis optimization uh, again. So given our current estimates for the pose um, and the shape code, we, want, we will decode the shape using the pre-trained uh, deep SDF decoder and uh, then we resynthesize our observations and our losses in this case were uh, photometric. Uh, we were looking at the, at the color of the, uh, of the point. So are we, are we actually observing um, the, same, uh, the same color? Uh, we had also a, a silhouette loss and we also had a key point loss. Um, so this is an optimization where we had uh, an image or a bunch of images and we were, we were fitting the parameters of the deep SDF codes uh, directly from, from these images. Um, and here you can see you know, a few results um, that are quite nice. This is single instance um, estimation on the Redwood data set. Um, so you can see that you know, compared to other approaches, our representations are, are much more complete um, and they, they really represent uh, the shape much more accurately. Um, and we also took, you know, even, even harder data sets. Um, so this is ScanNet. These are uh, sequences from ScanNet where we're trying to reconstruct uh, the different objects inside, inside a room. And you can see there uh, at the top and at the bottom, two different scenes where we have detected um, detected the chairs, we have actually matched them over the different images and estimated their pose and their full dense um, shape. And in follow-up work, we're now looking at embedding this within a, a SLAM system. And um, we are now um, estimating uh, in, in real time the, the motion of the camera. Uh, in this case, we're using the, the Kitty data set so we are estimating the motion of the camera 
Uh, and we are also reconstructing, whenever we detect uh, the cars in the scene, we're reconstructing the shape uh, using this uh, prior, using the priors, and we incorporate them into a joint map optimization that has both uh, points um, and, uh, and camera poses and objects as well. So again, it's, a, it's an object-based um, representation of the scene. And here you can see some examples. So we've got a few, uh, we've got some images here um, and we're fitting the, uh, we're fitting uh, shapes, shape codes for, for all of the cars that, that we can see. So in this particular case, we're using some 3D information. We have a few uh, LIDAR points as well that are, are very helpful to be able to run in, in real time. Um, and we should see a video here. Yes, uh, so here you can see the video um, of the car driving down uh, the roads and identifying the cars, reconstructing the cars. And it, it can actually also detect uh, cars that are, uh, that are moving dynamically and it can, can reconstruct also dynamic scenes. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to know if I, if I have any time left or, or not, Dan. Um, I, I think we're slightly over time already, but yes. um, okay. uh, feel free to, I mean, I think we can rearrange the workshop. Uh, we have a little bit of margin, so maybe you can, uh, like five more minutes or something like that. We have a few questions already. Okay. Uh, so up, to you, up to you, but, but uh, we're already a little bit over time. If, if I have... Uh, just a, a couple more minutes then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do I'll do just one more thing really quickly yeah um, no problem no problem you know we're in 2021 so of course you know if I didn't talk about nerf related um <laughs> nerf related representations then uh, yeah uh, it would be quite odd um so I guess I guess you're you're all familiar with uh, with uh, neural radiance fields for, for view synthesis um, so the idea is to have a, a set of input images and to optimize the representation such that you can you can render new views. You can really think about this um, in a in a in a sim similar way to to what I was talking about before this analysis by synthesis approach. Um, so you know these are the kind of results that that got everyone really hooked on on the on the nerve paper, and um, you know I think. Uh, everybody probably understands this this quite well now. Um, so the idea is we have uh, you have a, a, a bunch of images with known camera poses um, at training time, and uh, what you're trying to do is build a, a neural scene representation such that when we provide um, the coordinates of of the point and also the viewpoint, so the direction of the of the of the viewing vector. Um, we, sorry, uh, the, the network can actually infer two things, the RGB color um, and also the density of that point. And, you know, if we can do this, if we can train the network to predict these two things for every X, Y, Z position and from, you know, all the different viewpoints for, from which we have, we have images, um, then we can use volume rendering that's differentiable uh, to then render the color uh, and compare it with the ground truth uh, um, that, that comes from, from the images, from the pixels. So what's really exciting here is that, um, you know, when you compare it with deep SDF, deep SDF needed 3D information to train the network. In this case, you can train uh, this network directly from images. It's very exciting. This, this, this work is something that's really shook the, the community. Um, so we can, we can kind of, plot this in a, in a very similar way to at the beginning of the talk, right? So we have a bunch of images, uh, posed images for which we know the camera positions, and we generate a neural scene representation such that when we render all of those points back, uh, we synthesize back our images and our loss is, is a photometric loss. You know, did we synthesize our images back correctly? Um, and uh, so something that we've been working on recently is can we actually extend this for the case where uh, you don't, you're not just looking at a specific scene. Uh, in this case, we're looking at shapes of objects and their variation uh, 
uh, not just in shape, but also in appearance over a category. So you can think of cars and chairs and how their shapes and appearance is actually varying across a category. Um, and what we're doing is to actually simultaneously learn um, the MLP and two, uh, two different embeddings. One embedding is going to capture the variation, variations in shape and the other embedding is going to capture the variations in textures or, or appearance. Um, and we're doing the same thing. We're synthesizing the images again and comparing them with the original image observations. Um, so something that's quite interesting is that, you know, this can actually be trained even when we only have one single observation for every object. We don't necessarily have to have many, many different views of each individual object. Uh, we only need a single image from each of the objects and we can uh, learn. Obviously, they have to be distributed across the different viewpoints overall as a data set, but we don't need to have many, many, many observations of each single object. Um, and then um, this is also an auto decoder um, uh, architecture. So at, uh, at inference time, we get an image and we fix the, the network parameters and we optimize the shape and the texture codes. And we also optimize the pose of the camera. So at training time, we need to know the poses, but at test time, we can actually optimize them. We, need, we can up optimize the, the viewpoint. Um, and here you can see uh, how the optimization process is, is happening. So we start off from some initialization of a mean code and, and some initial estimate of the pose. And now we're kind of converging towards um, the, the, the shape, the texture and the pose that generates back uh, the original image. Um, and of course, we can now render new unseen uh, viewpoints that we hadn't seen before. Um, and another really exciting thing is that now we've got these two embeddings and we can now edit. Um, so what you can see here is that we can keep the shape fixed and we can then here are the target textures you can see in the second column and you can see that we can now edit the, the texture to adapt to, to a, new, a new texture. And here we can do the same thing, but the other way around, we fix the texture and we can edit the shape. So now we've got you know, really very, uh, very good control over the synthesis project, uh, the synthesis um, process. And, and this is you know, really quite exciting. Um, we can also reconstruct meshes um, and of course, because we're also looking at the uh, sort of separating or uh, disentangling the shape and the, and the color, we can also color the meshes. Um, and we can, we can work with real data. Um, so um, so, so that that's really brings me to, to the end of the talk. So, you know, what, what's next in, uh, in this exciting area? And, you know, I've just given, a tiny, given you a tiny flavor of this idea of uh, using NERF to represent object categories. Of course, we haven't been the only ones to do this. Um, there's been you know, previous work from, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, SRN, um, seen representation networks, uh, pixel NERF, we're trying to kind of solve the same problem. Um, there's been really exciting work from different groups, um, some of them represented here in, the, in this workshop uh, on how to, uh, represent uh, faces, for instance, using these, these neural radiance fields and how to reconstruct facial avatars uh, using these representations as well. Um, deformations, dynamic scenes. Um, so, you know, this is a, a really, really exciting area. Um, but, you know, just, just to go back to what I was saying before, I really see that, you know, we, we're all um, kind of working always in this, this same scheme of having a representation that's now maybe neural, uh, rendering, and then observing the difference between our synthesized images and, and our, our observations. Um, there's also been, you know, nice new work on, on NERF for relighting, so learning uh, also about the, uh, the, lighting, the lighting and the transient effects in a, in a collection of images, 
and uh, even real time reconstruction or tra and training of, of neural radiance fields from RGBD images. And in terms of you know, what, what I, I see in the future, um, uh, I've been recently involved in, in projects uh, where we're working in, in robotics and working with robots. And uh, you know, I think that we, we, we're doing incredibly well when, when we look at solving synthesis problems. I think that you know, we've really advanced a lot there. And uh, I can see that you know, even in Synthesia, we're, we're exploiting all of this already in really nice products that, um, that can be used for, for many real life applications. Um, but really something that maybe we're still scratching the surface on is coming up with representations that are actually really, that they're useful uh, for, for action. And they're useful for, uh, for, for robotic agents to be able to interact with humans, um, to carry objects together. Um, to do this, you know, we, we really need to go step up the game uh, learn other useful scene properties, uh, other afford affordances. Can we learn about safety? Can we predict human intentions? Can we uh, anticipate their actions? You know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, 3D that we're still that we're still not doing. Um, and you know, real time learning, learning on the fly from very few examples. All of all of this, I think, is is what's what's coming next for us. And with that, I'll I'll finish and and obviously thank. Uh, all the, the people who worked on these projects. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Lourdes. Uh, I just want to clarify that it went really smooth on, on, on YouTube and Zoom this time. So uh, yeah. I, 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 I think at some point you were wondering whether this was going correctly or not. Like I was really smooth. So um, uh, the last time. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to contact you during the talk. Like, hey, it's going well because you know sometimes you feel you just talk over the computer. But, but I guess we are very used to at this stage of the pandemic that just talk in front of the of the screen. So uh, yeah, so thank you for for very much. It was a great talk, a great summary. I personally like the the initial reminder about uh, classic methods that are in fact self supervised. Right, I actually recommend all the you know, more uh, junior researchers to look into a bit the old methods because now it seems that self supervision is is fundamental where we where we had it for a long time, right? <laughs> Before the, all the deep methods appeared. Um, there's many questions, so uh, we don't have much time, but I think being a keynote uh, in the workshop, I'll, I think we will rearrange a little bit the schedule to accommodate the questions. Um, so there's a few questions um, uh, on the YouTube chat that I will ask a bit later. Um, um, this, now that the end, you end up talking about NERF in the end, where it's all the really new cool stuff has started, I think there's, um, uh, there's an interesting question which says that what do you think can neural representations learn from your work on non-rigid structure from motion, right? So, so non-rigid structure from motion did a lot of fundamental works. So like the, the insights from these early works, how can, be, how can they be leveraged for uh, neural representations? I, I feel that... Uh, there's there's many many stuff to be done there, and and you probably have many insights from your earlier works. Yeah, so I, I just want to I, I just want to get back to this this slide here, um, where you know I I see that in some ways you know I I, I look at this and it, it's very it's very very similar um, to to this to the original the very first work that I talked about our work from um, from CBPR 2013 which is non-rigid structure from motion in that case our observations were 2d tracks um, but you know we were then able to to do the same thing with with images uh, with images as well and um, so you know we've got observations they could be tracks they could be images and we've got a bunch of images that are representing variations of shape uh, across a category. If you're looking at a face, then, you know, or if you're looking at a single object deforming, there's still deformations, uh, uh, deformations happening. And, you know, at, if you think of how we were, we were using low rank priors before, where we were learning the embedding at the same time as, as the reconstruction, as, as their parameters, this, this is a very similar thing, right? The idea here is you've got all of your images and now what you're trying to do is to learn an embedding um, that expresses the, 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 the variation of the, of the shapes. Um, you know, you can also push in some, some other embeddings uh, that, that explain, for instance, the differences in, in, um, in appearance. Um, but I, 
I kind of see that, you know, we, we, we're going back to this non-rigid SFM uh, world where, you know, we, we're looking at observations of, of, different, of different shapes from different viewpoints, and we're trying to really learn a compact representation. We're trying to learn a, a, a representation that can express the variations. And then, you know, it's, it's parametric. Um, you, you then have these codes that are, that are, that are going to, you, you, you can edit them, um, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you look at the, the recent work from, so this uh, work here, uh, from Matthias Niesner's uh, group, the dynamic mm -hmm. neural radiance fields for monocular, monocular facial avatar reconstruction uh, that's going to appear next week, um, be presented next week. In some ways, they're, they're doing something very, very similar. The only difference is that they're, um, they're first tracking the faces and they're using a, a, a model-based approach. They're using a morphable model to estimate the, the let's say, the code vectors. Mm -hmm. You know, and then um, then they then they 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 rendering, and uh, so it, it's it, it's exciting. You know, these these representations allow us really to both rep, uh, learn how to how how to get the geometric properties, but also how to learn compact embeddings at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's what we were doing in non-rigid SFM. <laughs> yeah. So in a way, you, you it's exactly the same thing, but maybe in a in a, in a yeah. different. Yeah. manner but the fundamentals are, are the fundamentals are, are very different mm -hmm. with non-rigid sfm you typically had a single sequence just mm -hmm. just one one sequence you were trying to reconstruct uh now it's more about you know having much more data um mm -hmm. but i think this this auto decoder representation is uh, or architecture is is really useful because then at, at test time you can then you know kind of learn the parameters of of that specific model mm -hmm. yeah so we have a bunch of uh questions that i'll go ahead with them um about nerf just the uh, last question about nerf uh, so what are the weak the nerf weaknesses when it comes to representing human body shapes or human body models in general um uh, you have this d nerf uh paper here in your slide right now which yeah. is a cpr paper and there's a, f a couple of more papers to uh, nerf with humans um, I wonder if you, I don't know if you are co-authored with any of those, but uh, what are your, uh, what are your uh, experiences or expectations for NERF for humans uh, or maybe articulated objects in general? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think these, these have been very, very nice works, but um, somehow I think that what, what's still very hard is to learn meaningful embeddings, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, the, the D-NERF paper, they have, you know, time um, as, as they're, let's say that that's their parametrization right mm -hmm. so that when you're editing you're, you're varying the time so you're completely constrained to whatever you saw at training time mm -hmm. so there is no like human uh, uh, skeleton or, or articulate explicit ex articulation that's right so there's 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 really no um yeah the 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 the, the uh, the embedding is not really meaningful it's not it's not in the space that, that we used mm -hmm. to and therefore, it doesn't allow us to control it in the usual way that we that that we used to write, you know, like move the arm or or or, or, or generate a specific uh, mm -hmm. motion, motion of the human. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that they have solved very nicely in the other the dynamic radiance fields for the faces. Mm -hmm. um, they've actually used a, a more let's say traditional method for tracking. They generate, you know, they they get the parameters from the, the embeddings from that. They're using, using model-based tracking and then using the, the neural radiance field for, for, the, for the synthesis and for generation. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think, you know, it, 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 what, what would be really nice is that the point where we can learn these very meaningful embeddings directly from the images rather than exactly. to have it as a, as a two-step process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that would be the, the, uh, the holy grail, right? So if you are if able to learn what, as a humans, we know is there, but, but we have we, without forcing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a few more questions. Uh, um, so about the uh, multi-person implicit shape model that you showed and, and Armini showing, uh, is presenting later at CPR this year. Uh, how was this trained? Like if the model was trained on synthetic data, 
or yes. how did you... mm -hmm. yes it was trained on synthetic data so mm -hmm. um is a, a, a data set that that's uh, that we we also provided uh, in the in the paper so that the, it's publicly available mm -hmm. um, cool and yeah, I mean, it, it does actually, it does actually work nicely on, on, on images. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, on real data, but of course, you know, to some extent, always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's the first one to do multi-person and, yeah. and, and, and without an explicit model. So it's, I think it's, yeah. it's very cool. And, and, you know, really uh, capturing the, the details of the clothing mm -hmm. and uh, that, that's, I think, a, a, a very, a very exciting mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Um, another question here, maybe to wrap up, let's see how long this takes. Um, so what, what the steps needs to be taken to create 3D of uh, complex scenes, like the images you showed in the very beginning of the presentation? I actually like the, this question because you, you start with a big challenge, right? And then you showed different steps towards solving um, parts of this challenge, right? But then we are still not there, right? Like uh, the, I think in any of the methods you showed is able to cope with uh, with the first image that you used. So, right. so uh, what 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 needs to be what needs to be done? Yeah, you can see, you know, the ingredients are kind of uh, many of the ingredients are there. Uh, we can now reconstruct multiple humans in a in a in a scene and and find out their from a single image and find out their their, their actual configuration in 3D. Uh, we, we can reconstruct individual humans with a lot of detail. Um, what needs to be done? <laughs> I, think, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the SLAM world, for instance, uh, I, I showed some, some work that we've done in SLAM, in dynamic SLAM, and they, I mean, these, these representations where you represent the scene at the level of objects um, are, are, very, are very exciting uh, in the sense that, you know, that now you have this, this graph structure um, that has the, that, you know, you, you identify different objects in the scene and, uh, you know, you're then, uh, you can then optimize at the same time, you know, you can use the different observations to actually improve the, the overall map. And I think that this idea of representing scenes with graphs at the level of objects is, is incredibly, uh, incredibly useful to think about representations like that, because you can then exploit individually the priors depending on the category that the objects belong to, right? So you could say, okay, these are humans, these are fruits, these are, um, and, and these are these are buildings, and this is this is background and um, and, and in, in my view, that, that's, that's the way, uh, really. And what sort of, you know, the, I think this, this overall graph that understands the, the complete layout of the scene is, is really the way to go. And then what you use individually for each of the objects, you know, it's probably going to be neural representations, of course. Um, uh, but I think there has to be something over, overarching that. Um, that that actually brings the whole scene together, and you know, some some kind of graph representation, I think, yeah. is, is yeah. the right the right way to go about it. Where you can then even, you know, the edges between the graph can actually tell you something about the interactions between between those objects, etc. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, obviously incredibly hard, and we're still yeah. far yeah, away yeah. from that, but. The good thing is we we still have a, a lot of work to do. Yeah, and, and well, and the progress has been like exponential, right? So who knows where yep. we are in, in, in five years from now? So yep. uh, Michael Solhofer, he just joined the session. So Michael is right here. I think Lourdes, Hi. you can see him. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I think Michael has Hello, a. Everybody. Hi, Hi, Hi. <laughs> I, think, I think we will, um, Michael uh, will have a final question for Lourdes, and then we jump in, uh, and then he will he will be chairing he will be chairing the next session. So I, I, I log off from the call. So thank you, Lourdes. I, I leave it up to uh, Michael. Thank you. I, I, Thanks, I, I think I don't really have a final question, but um, I, I found it really interesting to see this connection between non-rigid structure for motion and, and these nerve approaches, I, I think, especially if you think of the Nerfies paper you have on, on, on your yeah. slide. Yeah, like, yeah. It's basically doing the same. We are basically doing the same now with these like implicit right. coordinate-based representations than before. And it's nice to see this connection. Um, between these classical works and, and these new works now. Um, yeah, yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, this is uh, this is what you know. You, yeah, 
I, I was working in non-rigid structure from motion when it wasn't exciting. <laughs> Nobody cared about the problem, you know, and uh, uh, the, 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 the community was busy solving other kind of recognition problems. And now I think, you know, this, there's a very, very strong connection between, yeah, how we were trying to learn these embeddings and representations directly from, from images and the variations of shape. And, uh, and I think that the fact that we can now do it in a much more powerful way by, by learning from many more images and uh, training everything simultaneously, uh, you know, it's, it's very powerful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Um... Like, like one thing I feel that's, that's always good to keep in mind is that at least for these scene specific methods like Murphy's, for example, that, that don't see other scenes and other motions, like they kind of fail in the same scenarios, I guess, than the classical approaches. Like when you, when you, you don't have features, like if you have a white wall, for example, it, there's just no way to multi-view triangulate it properly. And they fail in the, same, in the same scenarios, but they fail in a slightly different way, like where in a classical approach, you would, you would get a hole in the geometry, kind of. Like, it, it will still paint something, but the something might be, might not generalize or might not be correct, kind of, for these new approaches. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's still kind of the same. Yeah, I think, I think that something else that's probably exciting and interesting is that um, I think these, so, you know, the, these fully connected networks are also learning themselves some priors about, you know, uh, let's say spatial smoothness, how, how to actually, you know, how to actually complete um, surfaces, etc. So, you know, in that, in that sense, they're, they're really quite powerful and obviously much more powerful than when we, we had to, we had to push all these priors, right? You had to have a, uh, a TV um, <coughs> prior for spatial smoothness. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah. That's a really good point. Um, yes, thank you again, Lotus, for the great talk and um, like answering these questions in so much detail. Um, this was a really nice, um, nice discussion in the end. And um, I, I'm a bit sorry for having to kill it, but I think the, the other organizers will kill me if I don't move on to the paper session now, because we are already a bit uh, behind in time. But, but thank you again for joining and for being part of that. And I hope you stick around until the panel discussion and then we can talk more about all that cool stuff. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Cool. So um, well, welcome, everyone. Again, um, we will transition now to the paper session. Um, I'm Michael Solifer. I'm a research scientist at Facebook Reality Labs in Pittsburgh. Um, I <laughs> I'm leading a research group there, and we work a lot on digital humans, so, so modeling their appearance, modeling their motion, and how, how that is connected to social telepresence, basically. And we also do a lot of neural rendering like everybody else right now. Um, in this paper session, we have, we'll have five really exciting papers today, um, four of which got directly accepted to this workshop. So they were submissions to this workshop, they got reviewed, and we found them to be really good papers, so they should be presented and one invited talk, which is a upcoming SIGGRAPH paper. So that should be really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, let, let's jump, jump basically uh, right in. Um, one more thing, um, the talks will, are pre-recorded, so I will be playing them, um, but we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please post your questions in the YouTube chat. Um, during the talks, I will record your questions and then I will ask them later. Um, and the authors are there to respond. Let's, let's jump right in. So the first paper um, is about dynamic appearance modeling from minimal cameras, and it will be presented by Louis Bridgman from uh, the University of Surrey. So en enjoy the talk, and I hope you have sound. Hi, my name's Louis, and I'm presenting our paper, Dynamic Appearance Modeling from Minimal Cameras. So performance capture is the process of uh, capturing the geometry and the appearance of a performer and the resulting sequence can then be played back and re-rendered from any viewpoint. This technology has applications in the film industry, the games industry, and virtual reality. Uh, typically, performance capture is required a large number of cameras, but this can be quite expensive. So we want to make full body performance capture possible with a minimal set of cameras. Recent advances have made it possible to reconstruct the geometry from a minimal number of cameras. For example, we're going to be using model-based reconstruction with the simple model. But with a reduced set of cameras, we also reduce the texture coverage. And so the problem we're wishing to solve is how to generate a full body texture with only a minimal set of cameras.
However, when we move, our clothing wrinkles and we cast shadows on ourselves. And so these details are really crucial when trying to create a really realistic performance capture. So rather than just filling in these empty texture regions with a constant flat texture, for instance, what we're aiming for is a method that uh, fills the unobserved texture regions with convincing dynamic details. There have been two sort of separate branches into generating full body textures from minimal set of cameras. The first is generating texture from monocular images. So these recent methods uh, infer the geometry and the texture from a single image of a person. However, the texture that it infers in the unseen regions of the back of the person, it usually reconstructs the block colours of the geometry, the block colours of the garments, but it doesn't really have the same level of detail as it does from the front. The second branch of work is reconstructing human avatars from a monocular video of a person turning around on the spot. So this combines observations over the whole sequence to create a full body texture. However, it is just a static texture, so it doesn't capture the dynamic details of the person. Our method exploits uh, repetition in human motion. So when we're using a minimal set of cameras, obviously we don't have full texture coverage for every frame. However, if the subject is moving, the texture coverage will change over the sequence. And if the motion is repetitive, which it often is, we can get observations of different texture regions for similar poses over time. We rely on the assumption that there is a relationship between the pose of the person and their dynamic appearance. But we observe that when we pick out pairs of similar poses from the sequence, you do see similar patterns of wrinkles, as we can see here. So rather than identifying these similar poses and trying to stitch the texture together manually, um, we use a neural network to do this for us. So our pipeline starts with a multi-view dataset of a person undergoing a few different motion sequences, and we select a minimal set of cameras from this. And so we use these camera images to fit the simple model, uh, and using this we generate a body pose and partial texture observations for every frame in our sequence. The input to the network is the 3D pose, uh, and we pass this through an encoder and decoder and output a full texture map. And we supervise our network with the partial textures we've generated. However, when we're generating texture maps from multiple cameras, unless the geometry is perfect, the texture maps won't accurately align with each other. And so this can cause artifacts if the texture maps are stitched together naively. And so the same as happens if we, if we supervise our network with these partial texture maps, we can expect similar artifacts in the output of our network. And so we look to the projective texturing literature for a solution, which is to use a weighted blending function. Weighted blending functions define the influence of each camera when combining the textures into a full texture. Uh, one of the most common functions to use is the angle between the camera and the normals of the mesh. So for every per camera partial texture, we also generate a viewing angle map, which is the dot product between the mesh normal and the camera viewing direction. Uh, so this weights down texture regions that don't directly face the camera. We also use semantic segmentation to deal with texture spillage between different body parts. So we compute a semantic segmentation map for every partial texture, and we combine these over the whole sequence to generate a consensus uh, semantic texture map, which encodes the likelihood of every point in the UV map uh, belonging to a specific body part. And then using the pair of these semantic maps, we can generate a semantic mask, which masks out regions of partial texture where the semantic labels are in disagreement. And so finally, we combine these viewing angle and, viewing angle and semantic masks into a single weighted mask. Also in the multi-view texturing literature, uh, they often weight different frequency bands with different weighting functions. Uh, typically, the high frequencies use a narrow blending function to minimize ghosting in the texture details, while the low frequencies allow a wider blending function. So we adopt this strategy and generate a second mask with a narrower viewing angle for high frequencies. Uh, so now going back to our network design, we now separate our network output into two frequency bands, high frequency and low frequency and we separately apply a weighted loss to each band using these new weighted masks. We evaluate our method on three different multi-view datasets. Each dataset comprises multiple sequences of a person undergoing different motion. We train a separate network for each, uh, and we re-render our results so that into the cameras that we didn't use for training the network. So these results for networks trained using only three cameras. We compare it to four different methods for generating textures. Uh, the first is Adisoft Metashape, which is a commercial software that does multi-view texturing. This method isn't really able to fill in the unobserved texture regions. Uh, the second method uses a video inpainting method to fill in the gaps using temporal context. It does a slightly better job, but still results in artifacts. 
We also compare to a PCA model. Uh, the PCA model we designed to, uh, to use a number of components that matches the compression ratio of our network. And finally, we compare to a static median texture computed over the whole data set. And both of these results really lack detail and they don't express any of the dynamic appearance in the ground truth. However, our method is able to produce full body textures for every pose in our input data set. And these include pretty convincing dynamic details such as the wrinkling of the clothing and the shadows. So we reproject the results back into the camera images and we compute the structural similarity index over all the cameras that we didn't use for training. Uh, we compute results using sets of three, four and eight cameras and we outperform all the other methods for three cameras and sometimes for four cameras. However, as we increase the number of cameras and thus also the texture coverage, um, some of the methods start to produce better results. Uh, and this makes sense because there's no advantage to our method that fills in the gaps when there are no gaps left to fill in. We also uh, complete an ablation study to measure the effect of our multi-banded loss function, which shows that separately weighting the high and low frequencies uh, does improve the result. And we also compute the compression ratio we achieve using our network. Uh, this is the difference between the size of our network and the size of a full body texture map for every frame. And we're able to achieve 30 times greater compression on the, the DAN data set, for instance. So here we're taking one of the sequences from the Thomas data set and we're up sampling the geometry and we're up sampling the texture using interpolation in the latent space to produce a slow motion rendering. Uh, here you can really see the dynamic details that are encoded in our network especially on the t-shirt. There are a few directions we could take the work in the future. Uh, the first is to address the blurriness uh, in the output that we can typically associate with VAEs. Uh, we can try to resolve this by investigating different network architectures or machine learning techniques. As well as learning a pose-driven model of dynamic texture, if we can modify the simple fitting method, we could also perhaps learn a, a pose-driven model of dynamic uh, geometry offsets. Uh, and finally, by adopting a monocular simple fitting method, our pipeline could potentially be used to generate an avatar with full body dynamically varying texture. Uh, that concludes my presentation, so thank you for listening. Cool, awesome. I'm, I'm back. Let's try to start the next talk quickly so we can catch up on time. Uh, the second talk is titled Consistent 3D Human Shape from Repeatable Action and Kaisuke Shibata from Kyoto University will be presenting. Our work, Consistent 3D Human Shape from Repeatable Action. We propose a method for consistent 3D closed human body reconstruction from a video of a person in action. What is a consistent reconstruction of the 3D closed human body? Reconstructing a human from a video is not an easy task. Existing single image methods reconstruct a single body shape from a single image. Applying an existing single image method for each frame results in frame varying in consistent reconstructions. In this example, arm shapes and leg shapes are different, even though their shapes should be the same across frames. This is because a single image has occlusions and ambiguities, which make this problem a highly ill-posed problem. Our method reconstructs a closed surface of the person that can be posed into every frame Existing reconstruction methods can reconstruct consistent SMPL shapes, but we reconstruct a consistent closed body. Our key idea is to exploit the repeatability of actions. The input to the method is a set of videos, each capturing a different instance of the repeated action from a distinct viewpoint. Such input data can be captured with a single camera. For instance, by having a friend capture one pitching at a time as they move around you while you repeat your pitching. 
given such a video, we reconstruct the 3D shape in action while calibrating the camera simultaneously. The input to the method is a set of videos, each capturing a different instance of the repeated action from a distinct viewpoint. This video can be casually captured with a single camera and does not require synchronized multi-view capture. If you capture k instances of a repeated action in n frames, you will obtain k times n view information of the body. However, camera poses are unknown and its motions are slightly different. Existing multi-view reconstruction method cannot be applied because they assume synchronized video capture and known camera poses. First, we simultaneously estimate the camera poses and temporal alignment of the repeated action. We achieve this spatial temporal calibration by leveraging the human joints as calibration targets. We search for the maximum inlier number of Samson distance between the 2D pose sequences. This number is used as the confidence for the relative camera pose estimated with the hypothesized temporal stretch and offset. Given the spatially and temporally calibrated videos, we fit a consistent 3D skeleton to the body. Then we use human bones to transform viewpoints of each frame into a common coordinate frame. For each bone of the 3D skeleton model, the camera location of each frame of each sequence is associated with the bone and rotated into the less pose bone orientation. We use geometric contour intersection rather than photo consistency to robustly recover the body shape. The transformed cameras for each bone collectively form multi-view capture sets for each body part. We construct a visual hull for each body part and then extract the body surface as a single watertight mesh model by free-form deformation of a generic 3D body model to fit the resulting collection of dense point cloud of 3D visual hulls. This recovered 3D human body model is textured by reprojection and consolidation of the original images. The results can be rendered as a free viewpoint video. We can reconstruct a dynamic closed human body that is consistent across frames. We compared our method with the related methods. All these methods can work with a video or an image taken outdoors with a single camera. The middle two methods are single image reconstruction, which does not produce consistent shapes. The right method, HMMR, is a temporarily consistent video-based reconstruction. But the clothing is not reconstructed. Our method produces a consistent shape across the frames. Another example of a free viewpoint video. Unlike learning-based methods, our method produces a closed, consistent human body model 
based on geometric measurements. In this paper, we reconstruct a consistent 3D closed human body from a casually taken video. Our key ideas are spatial temporal calibration with human joints, transformation into a bone centric coordinate, and collective multi view capture. Thank you for listening. Um. The third presentation is titled Temporal Consistency Loss for High Resolution Textured and Closed 3D Human Reconstruction from Monocular Video. So super relevant to this workshop. And Akin Kaliskan from the University of Surrey uh, will give the talk. Enjoy. Hello everyone, I am Akin. Today I'm presenting our work, Temporal Consistency Loss for High Resolution Texture and Closed 3D Human Reconstruction from Monocular Video. In this paper, we address the problem of reconstructing 3D human in a scene from a monocular video. And the aim is to obtain detailed and temporally consistent 3D reconstruction of people in the scene. As you can see, the side views of the temporally consistent reconstruction from a monocular video. However, existing monocular 3D human reconstruction methods suffer from following limitations. Voxel representation-based methods do not capture accurate 3D shape details. Implicit representation-based methods do not handle large variations in human pose. Single image model-free methods produce per-frame reconstruction giving temporal inconsistent output. We introduced a novel learning framework for temporally consistent reconstruction of detailed shape and texture for clothed people from monocular video. And also we introduced temporal consistency loss based on wide frame coherence of the shape and appearance reconstruction. A hybrid representation for learning 3D shape, which combines the advantages of explicit volumetric representation of occupancy with implicit shape details. 3D VH video, the first realistic synthesized video data set of 400 people with ground through 3D mode. Our proposed learning-based method performs temporal consistent 3D human reconstruction by first estimating voxel occupancy grid using temporal voxel regression network, followed by the hybrid implicit 3D reconstruction network that estimates point-wise occupancy values in 3D and hybrid implicit 3D texture network as shown in figure here. The proposed network is trained on a novel 3D VH video dataset introduced in this paper. Output of temporal voxel regression network is limited in terms of surface detail, so we propose a hybrid representation learning method to improve 3D reconstruction quality. In details, the proposed hybrid volumetric implicit 3D reconstruction network takes image and the intermediate voxel representation as input. Geometry reconstruction network predicts occupancy values for each point in 3D scene. For texture prediction, the proposed network takes image and reconstructs geometry as input. Texture reconstruction network predicts point-wise color for each point in 3D scene. The proposed network is trained on a new 3D virtual human video with image 3D pairs of a varying number of people in the images. The 3D VH video dataset is generated in three steps, as seen here. Close to 3D human model generation, motion sequence application of these models, and multi-view realistic rendering of the models with random placement without intersection. 400 male and female 3D human models with a wide variation in hair, clothing, pose, and random positions are generated for various motion sequences for more complete and accurate 3D shape estimation. Here are few example images, videos from the MPSC dataset are shown. Result and comparative evaluation of 3DVH data against PIFO, PIFO HD, and MCNET shows the, 
shows that the proposed method significantly outperforms existing methods in terms of temple consistency and reconstruction quality. Result and comparative evaluation on 3DVH dataset against PIFO, PIFO HTN, and CNET shows that the proposed method significantly outperforms existing methods in terms of temporal consistency in texture reconstruction. Temporal consistency loss together with hybrid implicit decoder are demonstrated to significantly improve the geometry and appearance reconstruction and achieve reliable texture reconstruction of human shape from a monocular video. Future work will exploit self-provised learning approach for temporally consistent 3D textured human reconstruction from in the wild video. Thank you for listening. Okay, cool. So the next uh, presentation will be super resolution appearance transfer for 4D human performances and Marco Pesamento will present, and he's also from the University of Surrey. Please enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Marco, and I'm going to present the work Super Resolution Appearance Transfer for 4D Human Performances. A common problem in the dynamic reconstruction of people for multiple view video is the quality of the dynamic texture appearance, which depends on both the camera resolution and the capture volume. Typically, the requirement to video cameras to capture the volume of a dynamic performance results in the person occupying only a small proportion of the field of view. This leads to a reconstruction of the capture scene whose resolution is extremely low, especially when compared with the static reconstruction ob obtained with a dedicated multi-camera photogrammetry system which presents brighter color and higher number of fine details, as you can see from the slide. This is mainly due to the fact that the volume of the static capture was minimized in order to guarantee a higher quality. A possible solution to this problem is to increase the number of video cameras and their resolution, but this will also raise the cost to build the capture system and that will be also less practical to be set up. Another way uh, is to reduce the capture volume, but this will limit the space where the performers can move. Uh, in this video, you can see like a dynamic performance capture with the system of the previous slide. As you can see, the, pre the quality of the appearance is very high and there are a lot of fine details. However, the movements are limited and the person just stand in the same place. To tackle this problem in a different way, we propose a pipeline that enhances the appearance of a 4D human performance capture by transferring it from a resolution reconstructor reconstruction without reducing the capture volume. After initial removal of the background from the input image, we apply a novel color mapping algorithm that balanced the color response between the two systems, which were producing different colors in the input images. In general, color mapping aims to transfer the color from a reference image to a target image without changing its content. Usually, generative adversarial network can be applied in an unsupervised scenario where the training dataset is made of unpaired reference and target images. However, for us, this method was not efficient due to the lack of data to create the training dataset. Therefore, we decided to explore another group of methods that model the color distribution as a Gaussian mixture model. These approaches learn the function from only a single pair of reference and target images, producing different results for every different couple. To apply the color mapping, couples between a reference and input image must be defined. For this, we propose an automatic method that selects optimal images of the two system according to surface visibility and viewing angle pairs. 
Applying common similarity metrics in the image domain to create these couples is not that efficient because the settings of the two systems are different. So we decide to operate in the texture map domain instead, but we had a problem. So we don't have the ge any geometric information for the high resolution images, so we can't use the texture map. And so we apply DensePose to retrieve the partial texture map from the original RGB images and the input frames. The couple between the most similar partial texture map of the two sets are selected by maximizing the SSM similarity metrics. And, the, and from this, the corresponding RGB images are paired as well. When the couples are created, the colors of the static reconstruction images are transferred to the dynamic reconstruction ones. And specifically, uh, and couples are selected, and on each image, key color regions are identified with the key means algorithm. From this, the color distribution are modeled as a Gaussian this as a Gaussian mixture model, and then are used to compute a set of parameters by minimizing the following energy function. Here it is important to notice that differently from uh, other algorithms of color correction. Multiple pair of reference and target image are considered in the computation of this energy, of this set. And from the resulting set, we retrieve the color transfer function and we apply it to every input frame to correct their colors. The texture map are retrieved from the corrected frames and finally super resolve with the super resolution network. A super resolution aims to increase the size of the images without introducing further artifacts. With regards to texture map super resolution, there are only two approaches in the literature. The first one exploits normal maps, while the second one creates an high resolution texture atlas from the multi view images. So, in the first case, so this one, retrieving normal maps for every frame is time consuming, while in the second case, uh, they don't retrieve the texture map directly from the 3D model as we do, but they create from directly from the input images. We therefore decide to apply a state-of-the-art single image super resolution network that we first pre-train with the dataset of human texture map cropped into patches, and then we fine-tune with the original texture map of the input subject. The final enhanced model is obtained by applying the super resolved texture map to the shape. Uh, we evaluate this pipeline, uh, the different stage of this pipeline through ablation study, and we compare them with the related works. We first try to create the couples of the most similar partial texture map by maximizing different similarity metrics and compare with the SSM results. And we can see that except for the case of the SSM, the subject of the high resolution images is in a different orientation compared to the one of the low resolution capture frame, degrading, in this case, the performance of the color mapping. We then studied the effect of using different number of reference and target in the color mapping stage. So if only one or two pairs are selected, the color transfer failed to correct all the color. And this is due to the fact that in a single or in two reference images, there aren't all the colors of a 3D human model. And only by using at least four pairs, all the sides of the model are seen during the learning stage of the color transfer function. Other algorithms were then compared with ours. And only our approach can like, succeed in producing accurate results. We then evaluate the effect of applying super resolution to enhance the details of the appearance. And as it possible to see in the pocket from the pocket of the model, it, this one is sharper than its lower resolution counterpart. These results are confirmed also from quantitative results. And particular, in particular, in here we are like comparing our approach of training, our configuration of training with other training configuration, and we can see that our achieved the highest results. 
And also when we compare we compare it with other state of the art super resolution network, we are still achieving the highest values for both the PSNR and SSM. Uh, finally, we compare different configuration of the pipeline by changing the order of the stages. So from the visual evaluation, artifacts can be seen in the dress and noise in the face of the model if our, if our order is not followed. In this two video, uh, we can see the original 4D performance on the left and the one retreat after the application of our pipeline in the right. In this one, the colors appears to be brighter and the appearance is enhanced. The pipeline presents some limitation that will be addressed in future works, unfortunately. It doesn't modify the geometry of the model and it is affected by the initial reconstruction. Temporal coherence is also not considered and this could provoke flickering artifacts, especially when the texture map are super solved. And the color mapping stage is ugly dependent from dense pose. And if it fails to detect the human body in the input images, then the capos could not be created. As I've tried to explain, we are working towards a practical solution to enhance for the performance capture by leveraging high resolution static scans to allow capture in larger volumes without sacrificing visual quality. So far, we were able to improve the global appearance through color mapping and to super resolve the fine details of the model. As a future work, uh, geometry super resolution as well as video super resolution will be investigated. And thank you for listening. The last presentation is titled Editable Free Viewpoint Video, video Using a Layered Neural Scene Representation and it will be presented by Jiakai Stang uh, from Shanghai University. And this is actually like a presentation of an upcoming SIGGRAPH paper. So it seems to be this is a world premiere for us here, which is great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on the third Dynamic Scene Reconstruction Workshop of CVPR 2021. I'm Jia Kai Zhang from Shanghai Tech University VLVC Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's topic, Editable Free Viewpoint Video Using a Layered New Representation. Dynamic human reconstruction plays an important role of dynamic scene reconstruction. It is also a core task in computer vision and graphics, and has been widely used in visual effects. Traditional human reconstruction approaches can be categorized as a passive way and an active way. In a passive way, people usually use a dome to capture pictures, modeling the human with fixed cameras and lights. This method may give a high-quality 3D model, but suffers from occlusion, high cost of device, and amount of space. We have reconstructed the musicians from Julia School for VR concert performance. As you can see, at the severe occluded area, the reconstructed results are flickering and raw. In an active way, we use a complicated light field stage with fast changing lighting to improve the performance of dynamic human face reconstruction. We can recover the ultra high details of the face. We can also recover more properties of dynamic faces. To this end, which enables the ability of relighting. This method is also a standard procedure for moving industry production, but the same problem is the device is too complicated and expensive. So we need to discuss new rendering and modeling for dynamic human. The first principle of new rendering is looking good on pro reconstruction. In other words, we accept the pro reconstruction of the scene, but we can use a neural network to achieve a good and photorealistic rendering results. Following this principle, we design new human rendering technique. Given a virtual camera, our method can generate photorealistic human rendering results and corresponding foreground masks simultaneously. As the video illustrated, we rendered the photorealistic results using only a noisy point cloud. Unfortunately, perfume point cloud is provided by the complicated dome, which is also hard to obtain.
Thus, we think further, maybe we can reduce the number of cameras. In this case, we use only 6 RGBD cameras to capture the scene, taking more advantages of network modeling ability. Also, we achieved a high quality rendering results. Then we think maybe we can only use the conventional RGB cameras. In this work, we use only RGB cameras to achieve a real-time free viewpoint video rendering. The second principle for dynamic neural human reconstruction is, instead of use an explicit representation for the 3D scene, we can represent the 3D scene implicitly by neural network. Recently, neural rendering field combines with volume rendering technique shows the groundbreaking results on the novel view sensitivity task. It reminds us such a differentiable implicit representation based on neural network has a higher capacity of the 3D scene with low storage requirement. In this work, we combine convolutional neural network with NERF to generate RGB images and alpha maps at the same time. Also, we achieve the high quality rendering results for fuzzy objects. But such methods can only handle static things. Following these two principles, our latest work generates editable free viewpoint videos using only 16 cameras. We achieved a photorealistic rendering result with layered implicit representation of the 3D scene. Given the six synchronized RGB videos covering a view range up to 180 degrees as input, our approach first includes a scene parsing stage to provide a layer-wise label map tracking with a 3D dynamic bounding box. Then, a new layer the neural representation is adopted to model each dynamic entity into a spatial temporal coherent neural readiness field, for short, STNERF. Finally, various neural rendering functions are introduced based on our layered representation to fully support perception and realistic manipulation of the dynamic scene. Our method takes military videos as inputs, then decomposes the scene into multiple performers and background viewed as several layers. Using a segmentation algorithm, we obtain the multi-view label maps for each layer. Label map is a per-pixel segmentation mask with entities in the image corresponding to RGB image. Compared with the state-of-the-art, our camera setting is much sparser with only 16 cameras to cover view range up to 180 degrees. By fusing label maps using a multi-view tracking scheme, we obtain the dynamic 3D bounding box for each layer. In this simple working sequence, we decompose the scene into two performer layers and background layer. We formulated each entity as a separated new readiness field represented by MLPs to record both space and time information in canonical space. It requires the network learn 3D deformation, density and color from varied space time and to canonical space. The main contribution of our method is that we introduce a new layered representation for large-scale dynamic scene modeling and manipulation, enabled by the disentanglement of location, deformation, and the appearance of all the dynamic entities. We call the network spatial-temporal coherent neural readiness field, for short, STNERF. At the core of our approach is a new layered space-time representation where each entity, including the environment, can be represented as an ST-nerve. As we sample points separately for each layer, we mix the sample points together in a layered-wise manner. Using volume rendering technique, we obtain a predicted pixel color of the original thing. Moreover, we can only predict the pixel color for one entity by removing other sample points. In this sample, we show the rendering results after removing the performer in white shirt. Using such a layered volume rendering technique, we can even add layers in space and time domain individually. We show more spatial editing results here. With a scaling operation, we create a giant fighting scenario for boxing. With both scaling and duplication operations, we create a fantastic scenario for Taekwondo. In the superheroes case, we first show the real interpolation result in our original camera positions.
then we can stabilize the viewpoint for smooth interpolation results. We'll create a new viewpoint path. Even free freeze time to achieve a bully time effect. We can also adjust the transparency of our performers. We gradually increase the transparency of the violinist until she disappeared. Then we shift her into another place to finally make her show up. In breaking case, we are timing dancers' actions so that their actions can meet the beats of the music. To conclude, we have presented the first approach to generate high-quality editable free viewpoint videos of dynamic scenes from only 16 RGB cameras. The core idea of our approach is layered ST-Nerve, which decomposes the dynamic scene into multiple layers so that we can easily edit each layer separately. Of course, there are some limitations of our approach. First, our approach relies on segmentation results. Our approach cannot handle those extremely challenging scenarios with severely occluded entities where the bounding box tracking fails. Also, because our sympathizing scheme relies on a human segmentation algorithm, we only show our results focusing on dynamic human. Besides, the tracked bounding box serves as a spatial anchor when training our estimate for an individual. Thus, a rich information outside the bounding box cannot be obtained by the network, leading to a worse real dependent effect especially for those light-changing scenarios. For example, the shadow of the layer may be out of the bounding box. Our algorithm cannot give a correct decomposition result. Here are the co-authors of this paper. At last, thanks for your attention. Welcome to our presentation at SIGGRAPH 2021. Okay, cool. Me back again. Um, so this was the last of our paper presentations. Um, we will now go into the Q&A session. Um, Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes for that, but we, we still want to ask a few questions and then we go directly into the next keynote. And I think we will skip the break as far as I've heard to make up for the lost time in the beginning. So let's get the presenters in. Okay, I al already see Akin is connecting, Marco is here, Luis is here. Hi, Ron. So we have one, two, three, four. I think one presenter is then no. still missing. Cool, awesome. Yeah, it's nice that you all, all of you are here. Um, I think let's jump right into the question so we don't lose time um, because we're sure. short on time. Um, let, let me see who is who is here. Um, Louis is here, yeah, exactly. So there, there was actually a question for Louis in the, uh, in the YouTube chat and it was about the generalization of your approach and if it would generalize to poses outside of the training set. So this is about the work on dynamic appearance modeling, so the first presentation. So yeah, maybe Louis wants to go into detail a bit about how, how it generalizes basically to pose is not in the training set. Uh, it, yeah, it, it doesn't really generalize. It can just about interpolate to poses between uh, poses in the data set. But if you try and get it to you know do a completely different pose, which I hasn't seen it, it won't do that. I tried doing some sort of uh, motion transfer. So I tried training the texture model on one data set and transferring the motion from the other, but it doesn't really keep that. Yeah, I, I think extrapolation is a big problem for all all learning based approaches. It's like the, the crux of all of them, I, I think, in the end. Um, I mean, the solution is to get a lot of different data. So every, everything has a nearest neighbor and then we are good, kind of, hopefully, uh, in the long run. Um, I was also wondering, uh, I also had a question about your approach, actually. Um, so it was about this, like, so you're modeling appearance, basically, and you had this, like, blending function based on angle to select which view. So I was wondering if you could learn that part somehow too, instead of having this explicit uh, scheme, and if you thought about that before. Um, yeah, I haven't really haven't really looked into that. I mean, this is really just inspired by you know the, the classical literature of, of texture blending, but I haven't really thought about learning those those blending weights. 
because it's, it's kind of like a view conditioning in a way, like based on from which side the viewer is looking at your model, you, you want to show, show a different texture to the person. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess in a way. Cool, awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for the answer. Um, maybe we have everyone here right now. Okay, cool, that's awesome. Um, I had a question for uh, Kai Suke. So that was the second, uh, the second presentation on consistent through the human shape uh, from repeatable okay. images. So I was wondering, in some of your results, you, there was, sometimes there was a head shown, and sometimes it was black, and sometimes it was missing. So I was wondering, like, was this for anonymity reasons, or like, does your approach reconstruct the head too, or? Uh, uh, so your question is your question is uh, asking uh, is head, head reconstruction is available or not? Yeah, exactly. Ah, I see. I see. Uh, uh, since human face, the human head is not articulated, uh, our method is not suitable for face reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the face can be replaced by employing the specialized method for face uh, because our reconstruction is registered to SMPL model. Okay, so when you when you showed the head, you, you just showed the simple head at the right right place. Yeah. Basically, yeah. okay, that, that explains it. I, I was just wondering because sometimes you had one and sometimes it was missing. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks, awesome. Um, let's jump to the third paper. Um, so this was temporally consistent, this temporally consistent loss for high resolution yeah. uh, textured and closed tree reconstruction, so Akin. Um, so, so I was wondering, like from the pipeline diagram, it looked really similar to, to Pi4 kind of in, in a way, like pixel aligned features and so on. And you also compared to Python. So I was wondering like which, which part in your approach makes the most different and gave you like a like an advantage over Python because the results yeah. look much better. Like what what's what's the key the key insight? Like if, if you can a, narrow it down a, to one. It's a really good question, Michael. Uh, there are two things actually which I want to mention. First of all, we are proposing some hybrid representation. Mm -hmm. We are not only using the pixel wise features and then the depth uh, value or depth, uh, I mean encoding depth values, but we are extracting some features from the voxel itself. In our previous work, what we investigated is that uh, in PIFU or uh, like implicit representation, implicit construction methods, uh, they are not a, they, are, they cannot easily handle the, some arbitrary or challenging poses. But what we observe is that in the voxel representation, okay, we are losing some reconstruction quality, but we are uh, inferring the, uh, how can I say, the, the general 3D, uh, how can I say, better. So we somehow combine them. This is actually one of the, uh, the advantage of our method. But, I mean, on top of the PIFU. Also, we, in this data set, we are using our 3D VH video data set, which also gives us some, uh, how can I say, better results. So we are training our uh, methods, our model, using our 3D VH data set, even if it is synthetic, uh, thanks to our um, realistic, uh, photorealistic, actually, rendering uh, technique in our data set, uh, we can easily generalize it for like synthetic and real data. Uh, like, yes, uh, Typhus data is somehow better uh, for generalization, to be honest, because it's a real capture. But somehow we are trying to reach uh, at that bar. So there are two main differences in between Pifu uh, or Pifu HD or other implicit reconstruction methods. You can say that. Cool, awesome. So so basically this combination of like this voxel exactly. grid for course reconstruction and then exactly. getting the details from the MLP exactly. in combination with like data augmentation based on like this. Exactly. Of... There is one more thing which I want to add. Uh, actually, our method is applicable to the video. So we are also proposing some loss function which we can use in between the video frames. So when we feed a video, uh, we are, um, how can I say, we are reconstructing the 3D in a temporal consistent way. But the PIFO or other PIFO H, the other single image reconstruction methods, they are just uh, taking one input image uh, and then there they are not, uh, there are no temporal consistency or they are not actually forcing any temporal consistency. So yeah, this is also another difference. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump to the, the fourth paper, uh, super resolution appearance transfer. Um, so that, that question is for Marco. Um, so so I, I think you had dense pose somewhere in there to, to, to get the geometry and then get the unwrapping to texture space in, in a way. And you, you mentioned dense pose. Well, sometimes it doesn't work. It might be inaccurate. Do you have an idea how to like in your, in your network compensate for that and maybe jointly learn uh, that yeah. to fix these errors? Because some of these like uh, in the wild trackers, monocular trackers, they are often wrong, I, I would say, especially for surface reconstruction. 
So, yes, we like applying dense pose, it's problematic sometimes. And we actually saw that the limitation of the approach is that if dense pose doesn't reconstruct the partial texture map, then uh, the couples cannot be created. Uh, but we saw also that when the partial texture map is minimal, so when it is still working, because like with the SSM is still like combining the right couples, and that was good. But we don't, we didn't do anything to to avoid to avoid when dense pose is not um, to solve when dense pose is not uh, is not working. So that that's an actual limitation of the of the approach. I see. Yeah, I, I think I was kind of wondering if you could learn a two D walk field like like predict like or something jointly so that you yeah. could correct for this misalignment somehow and jointly learn that for example. Yeah. yeah, probably there could be solution also on like yeah on on misalignments for sure. Yeah, yeah I think it's we didn't, really, didn't investigate. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a really important thing for the future to look to look at. Yeah. Um, like maybe even in combination with these like more neural representations where you yeah, definitely. start from a course initialization and then you learn this this delta in the end um, that like where your model is wrong. Definitely. Um, cool, awesome. Um, I also want to ask the last, so I, I know I, I'm already over the time that was allocated to me, but I want to ask a question also to the last paper, uh, paper author basically. Um, and this was an editable free viewpoint uh, video with this layered neural representation, which is a SIGGRAPH, upcoming SIGGRAPH paper. Um, and I, I, so Jakai is, is the author, and I, I wanted to ask explicitly about that last part about that SIGGRAPH paper. paper. Um, yeah. you, you, you kind of mentioned at some point that, well, these, these neural representations, they, they look good, but the geometry might not be, might not be correct or right. Yeah. Yes. Way. Can you provide a bit more, more insight for us on how much these models cheat and how good the geometry actually looks that, that your approach learns? Because the, the results look really great, but I, I would assume there's some cheating going on, kind of. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, it's a great question. And uh, uh, in, uh, in our uh, previous experiments, we do some um, geometry uh, experiments of nerve, and uh, we can um, extract the 3D uh, model by uh, using some uh, 3D Martian cube method, and uh, uh, it, which means we use the threshold to get the density of the nerve. And uh, we, we will find the uh, 3D reconstructed results are, are poor and uh, is poor. And um, uh, but uh, I, I think a new writing field is a 5D representation which uh, uh, combines with the um, uh, real direction and uh, it somehow fixes the poor reconstruction results to a uh, um, better uh, rendering results, yes. Exactly, yeah. um, it, it seems to be this viewing direction in a way because yes. you, like, like, it, like it has to disentangle geometry and appearance and it's conditioned on both in a way and it doesn't know how yes. to, to split. So it looks good, but like when the geometry right. is great. Right, it's exactly what I mean, yes. And, and so I was wondering, you had, how many cameras did you have for these sequences? Like it was a few, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, for this sequence, we use 16 cameras. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and it's and about a uh, uh, range up to 180 degrees. And, and it's a you, semicircle, yes. And do, do you have a feeling how, how, uh, how far you can decrease the number of cameras? Like oh. if you only have eight or four, at what point would it like, couldn't it triangulate the volume anymore? Do you have an idea? Uh, they are um, averagely have the same height, and uh, the the circle readings may be like uh, uh, we have some um, big big thing. Uh, it's like a, a stage, and it's about maybe uh, five meters to ten meters of the readings of the circle. Um, but but like oh sorry yeah I was asking about number of cameras I think like you have sixteen now. Uh, yes, sixteen you cameras. Eight. What if you only had eight, let's say, would it still oh. work? Oh, yes, I, uh, we, we, do, uh, we do did a, a, a ablation study, a study yeah. in our paper. And when the uh, camera number uh, is um, decreasing, uh, I think uh, the reconstruction result is will be more and more, um, uh, it will, will, be poor, will be poor. And uh, the, uh, but uh, the network can still, uh, Overfit the uh, rendering results on the uh, training training view. 
Yes, but on the testing view, like we are trying to render a, a free viewpoint video, uh, there, are, there will be many uh, ghosting artifacts and some uh, uh, wrong reconstruction result will be uh, very obvious. Yes, thank you. Then it doesn't generalize basically if, if uh, it overfit to the train. It can still overfit the yes. training set, but in yes. I think it's because the uh, reconstruction uh, uh, reconstruction problem is very ill posed. So even Nerf cannot uh, optimize the 3D thing uh, without uh, any prior of, prior of the thing. Well, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, thanks everyone for, for answering the questions in so much detail. Thanks for being around. Thanks for submitting your work here. And thanks for the invited speaker to give the invited talk. Um, hope to see you around later uh, in the panel discussion too. And let's go to the next keynote directly because I'm already seven minutes over time, I think. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> thanks, please take over. Thank you, Michael. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our second keynote speaker of Dynaviz 2021, Dr. Hao Li. Hao is CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen, a startup that builds cutting edge AI-driven virtual avatar technologies. He is also a distinguished fellow of computer vision of the computer vision group at UC Berkeley. Howe's work in computer vision and graphics focuses on digitizing humans, capturing their performances for immersive, tele, for immersive communication, telepresence in virtual worlds and entertainment. His research involves the development of novel, deep learning, data-driven and geometry processing algorithms. He is best known for his seminal work in avatar creation, facial animation, hair digitization, dynamic shape processing, as well as his recent efforts in preventing the spread of malicious deep fakes. How is going to be talking to us today about AI synthesis from, from avatars to 3D scenes. Um, and as a reminder to the audience, please put any questions you have into the YouTube chat. So how over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marco, for having me and thanks for the uh... Uh, introduction. So <clears throat> uh, again, so my talk is about AI synthesis from avatars to uh, 3D scenes. And some of the work I'm going to show today is, you know, some of the highlights we've been working uh, at Pinscreen uh, these days, as well as some of the research that I've been uh, doing at Berkeley. And uh, if you know some of my work, uh, you know, from the past decades, uh, you'll probably see a common theme, which is um, how do we solve the problem of making very realistic 3D avatars and uh, how do we make them accessible uh, to people, right? So um, this basically uh, is a direction where, you know, I've been looking at how do we leverage recent advancements in AI synthesis, uh, most specifically in the use of GANs, um, and also how do we, um, how do we go beyond that, right? How do we go, how do we digitize entire human bodies instead of just faces or hair? And how can we um, use some of these technologies for scenes? Another thing that's also um, something that is a uh, recurrent theme is uh, our real-time uh, performances, right? So how can we achieve uh, real-time capabilities? Um, because um, there are many, many very, you know, many, um, important applications that uh, have this requirement. And let me motivate a little bit uh, some of the work uh, that I've been doing. Um, as you know, you know we're um, currently still not having um, the ability to, to meet physically and you know, uh, travel around. And one of the things that this pandemic is kind of like showing us is that um, you know, a lot of these virtual meetings, virtual conferences are in some ways here to stay and also the way we're working together. And uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I think has, is really, really um, inspiring is, um, you know, this, this really nice concept video from Microsoft that basically shows how the future could look like, right? So what if people are, you know, leveraging, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, in order to um, sort of enhance our physical presence with a virtual one, right? So how can we enable things like telepresence? How can we uh, use, you know, 3D avatars of ourselves so that we have the ability to interact with each other? 
And that leads to a lot of important aspects where, um, you know, the idea of creating content becomes really important. And if we sort of like go back, you know, one or two decades, people have been starting to think about that, right? So they started to look into how do we digitize things from the physical world? How do we use 3D scanning? How do we use uh, 3D computer vision to create content, right? Whether it's scenes, whether it's uh, humans, uh, performances of people, how do we capture all these content and bring them into a virtual world? Now, one thing that is uh, really interesting is that um, it, in the past, it always assumed that you have this 3D scene that is represented you know, using traditional computer graphics pipeline, right? So you always have this digitization and then you have your 3D scene. And then the question is, how do you render that? And one of the things that we're seeing recently is um, you know, how are people using you know, things like neural rendering to improve, um, to improve the ability to generate things that look very realistic and basically to bypass sort of like this traditional approach of modeling three-dimensional content, right? So here's a really nice example of uh, Facebook Reality Labs um, uh, avatar codec uh, uh, system. So it's basically, you know, the system that allows people to um, digitize themselves and have the ability to, in real time, generate a realistic um, representation of themselves, right? Using um, some form of neural rendering where the input uh, uses, you know, incomplete capture of, you know, facial performances. Another aspect that's also very important is um, our ability to digitize content very quickly and also to bring AI into a framework where we have the ability to interact with a, you know, sort of virtual agent, right? So there are some studies that are showing that 85% of all the customer interactions, online services are going to be without human agents by the end of this year. Um, obviously a lot of that has been accelerated uh, due to the pandemic. So everything is going virtual. And there are companies that have been working on solutions that are you know, creating human-like interfaces, allowing people to interact with these avatars, right? And we're also seeing a lot of really cool work from other companies. Here's an example from uh, Samsung Neon, where they're using some form of neural rendering, um, you know, to generate very, very realistic appearances of human faces. Another great example um, is, you know, Synthesia, right, which is generating 2D videos that gives you the ability to manipulate uh, the person. This is one example where real-time performance, for instance, is very important. Now, another aspect is the ability to create content, right? So, and content does not necessarily mean, you know, tr traditional um, Hollywood content, but it can be things that are life, right? So uh, we're seeing right now that, you know, an entire uh, life events industry being sort of like shut down for a while and then, you know, now starting to pick up, but still the interest for virtualization is still pretty high because, um, you know, we all want to be, uh, in a safe, um, uh, safe scenario, and uh, people are looking into various ways to enable that, right? So, how do we virtualize these things? And I think one of the you know really interesting examples are, for instance, you know, this Travis Scott's um, rap concert uh, that is thrown entirely inside of Fortnite. Uh, so, this gives another aspect of how we can actually virtualize. Um, you know, life events uh, inside something like a game engine, right? And uh, this is really interesting because you can have a much bigger reach, for instance, you can have, you know, tens of millions of um, people that are watching your concert life. And uh, another thing that's really interesting is also, you know, things like um, celebrities that aren't even like real people. So people are experimenting on how do we enhance these virtual experiences. Another, um, really interesting aspect is also um, the ability to go beyond 2D. And that's when uh, 3D content becomes really interesting. One thing that we have to assume is that, you know, very possibly in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be uh, a mainstream adoption of, you know, augmented and virtual reality um, <clears throat> type of headsets where, you know, the um, consumption of 
uh, 3D content will become um, uh, mainstream. So we're looking at basically three kinds of categories of applications where um, you know, the use of AI synthesized content and very specifically for humans uh, is going to be critical. The one that is in terms of communication. So if we interact with each other, um, the uh, ability to interact with a machine uh, in a human-like way, right? So that's possibly the most intuitive way of interacting with another device will require a form of virtual agent. And then the third one is about content creation, right? Whether we're creating um, virtual influencers, whether we're creating, um, you know, trying to digitize, you know, a life event, a music concert, a sports event, all these things will require the ability to digitize things at scale, right? So one of the things that uh, traditional pipelines do not allow us to tackle these problems is that, you know, obviously the creation of CG humans is something that not only it's very difficult, it's also something that takes a lot of time uh, to generate, right? So traditional computer graphics pipelines uh, rely on, you know, big studios with a lot of digital artists. And one of the reasons for that is because, you know, the, the process of creating the content is just very complex, right? So you have a combination of 3D modeling, animation, simulation, and then all this rendering and lighting process requires, um, you know, fine tuning and, uh, you know, using skilled uh, digital artists. So that's one problem um, that, you know, AI can solve in, in this case. Um, here are some uh, really nice advancements in terms of real-time rendering. So we're seeing that, you know, here's a great example from Epic Games where they're pretty much using a real-time computer graphics pipeline to show how we can still generate highly realistic humans, but still, right? You still have this tiny bit of uncanny valleyness uh, in the face. It's advancing a lot, but still, in order to generate these humans, you still have the problem that, you know, you need an authoring tool. And more specifically, if you want to digitize a very specific person, you still need to use a form of capture. So computer vision becomes really relevant here. So when, you know, I was um, working, working at uh, USC, um, you know, at uh, the uh, USC Institute for Creative Technologies, one of the problems that we were uh, trying to address was how do we digitize very realistic humans, right? So, you know, the standard way for, you know, big Hollywood production was basically, um, you need to scan the person, you need to scan every aspect of it, you need to obtain high resolution 3D scans of the subject, and you need to, you know, capture um, basically texture assets that are high resolution that you can reuse uh, in combination with complex shaders that are physically correct that you can re-render inside a virtual environment, right? So it's important for animation and for rendering. Now, obviously, uh, these kind of devices and also the amount of post-processing time that is needed to generate um, a content that can be used um, is something that we want to solve, right? So if we want to enable these kind of applications I was talking about before, which is enabling things like communication, um, you know, that requires um, consumers to generate their own avatars. So you, people won't be able to afford these kind of devices at home. So that's the sort of problem that we're solving here at Pinscreen, right? So at Pinscreen, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make avatars highly realistic. We're trying to make them accessible so that people can instantly generate them. And then obviously the question is, what is the easiest way to create these type of content? And, you know, what we think is people should create avatars as easily as taking a photo of themselves, which means how can you use computer vision to generate a as realistic possible 3D avatar as possible, but also one that can be used inside a virtual environment, right? So let's talk about 3D avatar synthesis. So this is a recent work that um, we're, uh, we have published here at CBPR 2021. Um, and I'm just going a little bit over the, um, give a little overview of how we solve it. And I welcome you to uh, read the paper and also uh, attend uh, the uh, paper presentation. So 
reconstructing 3D faces from you know, unconstrained input photos has been something that a lot of people have been working on for a very long time. Um, everything starts from you know, 20 years ago with uh, 3D model face models. Um, and uh, there are several important extensions, right? So here's a work from Tease and coworkers from 2016 where they added you know, facial expressions and also real-time iterative op optimization. Um, another work, more recent work from Deng and coworkers uh, uses a deep neural network to inf infer you know, the data instead of a traditional gradient-based optimization. And um, maybe one of the more recent work from Lee et al. 2020 uses a nonlinear 3D multiple phase model. So you can see one of the advantages here is that you have the ability to <clears throat> represent, you know, uh, things like facial hair textures, uh, teeth, eyes. So things that become a little bit more complex that you can't uh, capture as, you know, as detailed using a traditional linear 3D multiple face model. Now, the problem with that is that the avatar that you generate has a lot of the input photo uh, information baked in. I mean, it looks like a really, really impressive 3D avatar if you look at the latest work, but you can't use it directly inside a 3D um, game engine, for instance. So what you need to do is basically normalize the inputs. So when, you, when we think about normalization, there are multiple ways we can do that, right? So the first approach is you say, well, Let's take an input photo and uh, normalize the face using something like FaceNet. And um, you can basically obtain the identity, you can extract the identity of the person and basically regenerate uh, using a decoder of the person that is sort of like front lit with a diffuse lighting and a neutral facial expression, right? So this is a very effective way of generating the avatar. Uh, but you know, some of the problems is that you don't have like full control over the content and you sometimes have these kind of artifacts. And those kind of methods also fail when you um, have, you know, uh, faces of the person, uh, you know, when you have other parameters like, you know, aging, wrinkles, and all these sort of like details aren't really encoded because these methods still use a linear uh, 3D multiple face, underlying 3D multiple face model as intermediate representation. So one of the uh, new things that we've built is try to enhance the, this uh, sort of like generation of normalized 3D face model in the following way, right? So what we try to do is come up with a way where you have an input photo with extreme lighting conditions, arbitrary facial expressions or face orientations and still have the ability to generate a normalized 3D avatar that you can relight it inside an arbitrary environment, right? And um, the idea here is that, first of all, we're basically making the normalization process nonlinear using a StyleGAN uh, network. And uh, the second thing is basically we're trying to, um, we're trying to uh, synthesize a three-dimensional representation directly using a parametric texture space, right? So we're changing the way it's generating uh, the avatar. So what is the problem of this process? So if you think about it, if we had every person in the world, or let's say a large amount of them, then we can basically, and we have all their normalized data, it wouldn't be that hard. The only problem is that all this data isn't really available, right? So we need to, um, uh, live with, uh, all, you know, having only limited samples of, you know, 3D scans of people with neutral faces and some of their corresponding facial expressions. So because of that, our ability to generate faces directly is very limited. So what we need to do is handle very, very challenging input data, such as, you know, extreme facial expressions of people and you, it's really hard to imagine that we can capture all these people. Um, lighting conditions, extreme head poses, and generate an avatar that can be, you know, um, represented inside any game engine. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we divide this problem into two parts. The first one uses, is basically, it's called the inference stage. And the inference stage basically uses 
the limited amount of training data, we only have like a few hundred, um, you know, ground truth data where we have the neutral 3D scan of the person and some facial expressions. And using very limited data of those, we can generate an intermediate avatar, right? So the full likeness isn't there yet. And what we do in a second stage is to use a refinement stage to iteratively improve uh, the likeness of the subject. So let me show you a bit how the inference stage work. So first of all, for the inference stage, as I mentioned before, would like to extract the identity of the person. So we'll use something like FaceNet that has the ability to uh, infer the identity uh, of the person. And what we need to develop here is, is plug in another regressor that can map the identity output of the FaceNet to a StyleGAN2 generator. We then modify StyleGAN2 so that it doesn't generate an image of you know, a new person. Uh, an image space, but basically generates an avatar that consists of a 3D mesh and a uh, corresponding texture map, right? So the 3D mesh representation is represented in the following way. So you can see there's actually a 2D image where each of these pixels basically represent uh, sort of like an XYZ position of where the um, mesh should be, right? We also use a offset-based representation in order to um, make uh, this generation more stable. The refinement stage, which is the second part of it, uh, uses a differentiable rendering approach, right? So first of all, we use the optimized latent vector. Uh, then we use a style again too to basically generate um, the you know intermediate uh, albedo map and the position map of the avatar. Then we take the input photo. Um, this is basically helping us to compare against what we generate and the input photo that we have. We use two networks. First, we use a PSP net to generate a segmentation of the face. This is to identify the relevant area. And then we use ResNet, um, a, a ResNet network to generate camera parameters, right? So basically, um, where is my um, face going to be oriented to? So we use all these three components, plug them into a differentiable renderer, and then basically iterate this process in order to refine the generation of um, the avatar. So by doing so, we can actually generate um, very realistic avatars. The inference is actually pretty fast. It actually just takes one or two seconds, <clears throat> but the refinement stage is the one that takes, you know, you know 30 seconds uh, in order to uh, produce an avatar, right? So here's like sort of like a live demo system where we sort of like combine this avatar generation with the fully rigged uh, avatar. So that's a new product that we haven't uh, announced yet uh, at Pinscreen. And this is something that we're going to use uh, for applications like, um, you know, VR-based uh, avatar telepresence. So let me show you a couple of results. So these are basically normalized uh, 3D avatar, um, 3D avatars that are being synthesized. As you can see, we can, you know, it has a joint inference with the appearance of the person and the um, and the geometry. So what it means is that even for black and white images, we can generate plausible um, texture colors. Um, it's very, very robust. So these are all extreme in the wild images, right? So um, one thing that we also show is that for the same person and with very, very, uh, different input images, we can generate um, reasonably plausible um, or reasonably consistent uh, 3D avatars of the face. Uh, this is what happens when we have, when we're processing every frame independently so of, of a video. So he's doing different expressions. It's not perfect, but you can see that it retains the likeness of the person and also generates relatively plausible output images, right? Um, and this is, what happens when we have extreme lighting variation. So you can see we're changing the color drastically, but still it's able to, from the appearance of the person, has have the ability to generate a plausible skin tone. Now, this is what happens when we compare with the state of the art. So you can see that the main contribution here is really that we're generating an avatar that is normalized, right? It's it has a consistent diffuse lighting condition of the avatar. 
um, the facial expressions are normalized and um, also the poses are uh, normalized, right? So that's something that, um, it, this is where uh, the algorithm performs really well. This is something that we're working under the hood. So um, this is uh, some more recent things that we're working on is basically aiming at high definition normalized avatars, right? So we're trying to build really high quality avatars using this approach, using a um, super resolution approach to generate more realistic avatars. So that's something I'll hope to show uh, very soon. Okay. Now let's talk about um, avatars that can be animated, right? So we've shown a little bit how we use 3D synthesis to generate avatars that can be that can run on a standard game engine. But now the question is, do we have to use a 3D engine or can we use a neural rendering approach to um, generate more realistic avatars uh, that are dynamic, right? As the name of the workshop. So this is a work that maybe some of you have seen before. Uh, this is our so-called Pagan um, uh, project. So Pagan basically consists, of, I mean, it stands for Photoreal Avatar GAN. Uh, it's basically a GAN network that can generate realistic facial expressions out of a single input image, right? So the input image on the top right, these are input photos where the synthesis con is conditioned on. And it's using the driver on the video on the left to generate the facial expressions. So this is something that happens in real time. And uh, the intermediate representation here is a very basic, um, sort of like a textured uh, mesh of a um, uh, 3D head model. We have uh, increased uh, the quality of this using a, a different type of network. Uh, so this is our uh, pig and two system. So sort of like a real time face swapping uh, demonstration uh, to highlight the ability to do things like real time deep fakes. And it's sort of like an extension of what you had before where the data isn't conditioned on a single video, but is trained using a, um, you know, minute long video sequence of uh, the target subject. But one thing that's important here is that we allow the ability for any person to drive uh, the avatar and also have the ability to generate the avatar in the ultimate. Now, why do we create this? Um, I think Marco already mentioned before, we're doing some work for you know cybersecurity, which is how do we um, explore new capabilities for video manipulations, et cetera. But one of our main reasons for real-time synthesis of avatars is to develop sort of like a hybrid approach to create very realistic CG uh, humans, right? So <clears throat> one of the advantages here is that we can plug this sort of like um, neural rendering component straight into a game engine like <clears throat> the Unreal game engine. And uh, this is one of the work that we've done where we're basically showing how we can do real-time realistic rendering of faces using a little bit of training data and incorporate that inside a game engine. So let me play this video real quick. So this is on the left, you can see the uh, um, you know, pure unreal rendering of digital uh, of uh, Mike Seymour. And on the right, you can see sort of like this neural rendering of Mike Seymour. Hi, this is Digital Me, kind of a successor to Mate Matt. This is me driving this digital character in UE4, thanks to a persona rig from Free Lateral that's reading my expressions feeding into a pre lateral facial rig inside UE4. I also have on an XM suit to get my body motion. Okay. And this is great, we love it. But as much fun as I am sitting here at the Modus Lab in Sydney, I can take this to the next level thanks to our friends at Pinscore. So what we're building this for is, so one of our um, customers at uh, Pinscreen is we're working with, um, you know, one of the top, um, fashion companies in Japan to basically virtualize their entire um, sort of like their entire products where instead of having, you know, real fashion models, they're going entirely virtual where we're starting to replace um, virtual fashion models with, um, well, replacing real fashion models with uh, virtual ones, right? So uh, here, these are examples of CG, real-time CG renderings of, of uh, virtual humans 
that use basically this neural rendering approach, right? So we're also developing systems that use performance capture uh, combined with these CG humans that are rendered in Unreal. And <clears throat> one of the, uh, uh, we, we've also created a little experimental, um, uh, experimental um, outlets where, you know, you can basically see those uh, virtual influences, right? So basically 3D avatars that are, you know, embedded into real worlds, uh, but they're all using these uh, pagan neural rendering technologies. And one of the things that's really nice is that it allows us to create, um, you know, these kind of video content at scale, right? We can generate uh, three of these videos per week uh, using a tiny team. And um, one of the things that it really accelerates is really the ability to generate very realistic human faces. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I've shown a couple of examples where, you know, we are, how do we generate how do we use AI synthesis to create, you know, avatars that can be used inside a, you know, existing game engine? I've shown how we can modify game engines so that we can have more realistic facial renderings, uh, but they're all using the sort of like parametric approach, right? Now, another thing that we've been working on is uh, more on the research side is how do we enable things like volumetric teleportation, right? So instead of digitizing an avatar, using a traditional representation, how can we just, you know, have the ability to capture something as it is, a little bit like in a 3D scanning setting, and basically render this in real time directly. So a bit like a 3D video <clears throat> idea. And this is something that, you know, many people have been working on. Um, here's an exact recent, you know, demo from Microsoft uh, showcasing some use cases of their HoloLens 2, uh, where you have basically uh, people that are in some ways teleported inside this, um, you know, virtual or semi-virtual environment. And um, <clears throat> one of the ways to do this, um, this is a, a demo from also from Microsoft Research um, called Holoportation. So the idea here is that you have this specialized room with a lot of cameras and, you know, real-time 3D capture capabilities. And uh, you can basically stream this content from one point to another. The only disadvantage of this is that um, you need a sort of like the specialized room where you can enable things like volumetric capture, right? So uh, you need, this is another example from a company called Evercoast where they're using, um, you know, uh, multiple Intel real sense depth sensors that are placed around the person. You need to th do things like, you know, background segmentation, uh, point cloud reconstruction, fusion, and then stream the content from one point to another. Now, the reason why this is not really practical and something that is hard to adopt is that it's hard for me to imagine how people will have these kind of technologies at home. The only reason why we have, why we can communicate uh, virtually these days is that, you know, most of the devices that we're using only have a single camera in there, right? And uh, one of the questions we've been asking ourselves, you know, a couple of years ago is how do we, is it possible that given a single view of uh, a person, you have the ability to digitize the entire person? So in collaboration with, uh, you know, Waseda and UC Berkeley, one of the work that we've been looking at is given a single input image, how can we digitize a person? And the work is called uh, PaiFu, right? So pixel implicit, uh, pixel aligned implicit functions is uh, a new data representation that we have introduced and published back then at uh, ICTV. And uh, the idea is that given a single photo um, after background segmentation, we have the ability to create a reasonably, um, you know, high res uh, mesh of a person and uh, the texture uh, in both the front and the back of the input data, right? So there are two main things that were critical to this. The first thing is that instead of using something like a voxel-based representation that's, as we all know, uh, takes a lot of memory, we use an implicit surface as underlying representation. And uh, for the inference, instead of, um, you know, encoding everything into a global uh, feature vector, what we do is we have a feature vector that's sort of like aligned with the input image resolution and have basically for each pixel, a individual feature vector that's still takes into account the whole context of 
uh, the input photo. So by using the combination of these two approaches, uh, we were able to show that from a single input photo, you can generate complete 3D models, uh, including the textures. One thing that's kind of interesting is that you can see that even parts that aren't parts of the human body also get digitized. And what's also interesting is that very limited amount of training data was actually used. So it somehow can uh, generate um, plausible content from very limited amount of data. The only limitation in this early work was that um, digitizing a single frame requires roughly a minute of computation. So, if, and that is uh, prohibitive for applications such as real-time teleportation because you can't wait a minute per frame to digitize the person and then send this data and then render it. So one thing that we've been working on last year is, um, and that was a work that was presented at ECCV, is how, how we can make that real time, right? And there are um, a couple of things that we introduced here. Uh, one of them is basically sort of like an octree based um, representation that allows us to do inference much faster. This is combined with some engineering, um, some low level engineering uh, to basically do scheduling uh, using multiple GPUs uh, in order to make this thing real time. So you can see here, this is only using a single uh, Logitech webcam. It's capturing um, uh, my student and he is basically being digitized in real time uh, on the screen on the right. Here's another visualization where you can see uh, we're rotating the subject um, you know, 360 and you can see the back of the person is being generated. And uh, we're also showing how it's possible to stream this content in real time uh, onto an iPad. So the idea is that you capture the person and then in real time, you can stream the content onto another device, so remotely, and you have the ability to you know, move the device around and see the entire person from the front and the back, right? So this is still really far away from you know, things that we see in uh, science fiction movies like Blade Runner 2049. Um, where you know you have this like super high definition person, but hopefully this is you know an important step toward um, this direction. The only thing that I think is kind of like missing here is sort of like uh, how can we see this kind of like three D content without three D glasses, and that's another thing that I think um, is not out of the question, right? So this is an interesting work from the uh, Brigham Young University. It's a Nature publication where uh, scientists are showing how we can use a combination of lasers and particle systems to produce, you know, sort of like a early version of what a hologram can look like, right? So regardless, I still think that our first experiment experiences in, you know, for these kind of like 3D content is going to be um, with things like AR glasses or virtual reality glasses. Um, so that's something that's, you know, I've conducted a recent study where um, you know, we think that uh, those kind of things are going to be, you know, pretty much mainstream in the next five to 10 years, right? So this is something that's going to be uh, very likely. Cool, so now I've shown a couple of things about how we use AI uh, or, you know, deep neural networks to um, digitize an entire person, right? So this already goes beyond um, the idea of creating an, an, you know, a, parametric 3D avatar. And so the question now is why not go beyond 3D humans and go into entire 3D scenes, right? There's something really nice about this, which is it's trying to not represent explicitly the 3D content like with traditional methods. Everything is implicit. And um, I'm pretty sure many of you have heard of uh, the concept of NERS, neural radiance fields. Uh, which is sort of like a very new representation that allows you to go straight from um, captured data into a rendering of a scene uh, from arbitrary views. And one of the differences between this and um, you know, 3D point cloud or 3D mesh is that you encode uh, the appearance properties directly into the scene. And most importantly, you have things like view dependent effects. So one of the things that we've been working um, recently uh, with uh, Andrew Kanazawa's uh, group is uh, this, the ability to do real-time rendering of um, 
you know, nerves, right? So we're basically introducing a new representation that we call pillar knot trees. And what's really nice here is that you can basically encode an entire scene, right? With material appearance properties independently of its complexity to some extent. So it's not like based on how many vertices you have, uh, but it's based on, um, you know, it's just like this, it's sort of like a real 3D implicit representation of the scene, um, allowing you to see things in real time. I'm going to explain in a little bit why this is important. So first of all, quick recap. So NERFS basically allows you to take calibrated input images. You can optimize a model and you can basically render the scene from arbitrary views. This is different than, as I mentioned before, from a 3D uh, reconstruction of a scene uh, using explicit you know, 3D coordinates or textures or you know, 3D colors, like uh, colors represented in 3D. Um, in that you have basically the entire scene being represented implicitly, right? So the way it works is that you would use uh, this. So the, the way neural radiance field, neural radiance fields are being represented is that you have as inputs a 5D um, representation that consists of positions and the directions of which you're viewing at. And the output is basically the color and the density. And to basically generate uh, the resulting input image, you basically sample a long array, and then you basically aggregate uh, the colors in order to produce the final image. Now, how do we make this real time? So the original version takes you know minutes to basically uh, generate a single frame. Um, the first thing that we do is we use a combination of voxel um, octree representation. So we use an octree to have a sort of like a sparse and also this hierarchical representation of the scene. And most importantly, for each um, voxel of this octree, we represent them with a spherical harmonics that allows us to encode the view dependent, um, the view dependent appearance of the scene at that specific location. So during rendering, what we do is we shoot away, basically sample these voxels and aggregate the spherical harmonics in order to generate the scene. So this combination allows us to basically render everything in real time. So this is a viewer um, that you see. It's, it's also showing the octree structure of this object, and we can basically represent that in real time. So this is a, com you know, a comparison of how much faster this approach is compared to the original NERF. So it goes up to 3,000 times faster. And um, what's really nice is that um, you know, we can basically represent any scene uh, or objects independently of the material and you know render from you know using a sixth degree of freedom uh, viewpoint. So the reason why this is important is that um, the only way for us right now to view things in you know AR or VR that is captured directly from the world are only these 360 pan panoramic views. Now imagine if you wanted to create this like if you want to add six degree of freedom, the only option we really have nowadays is to use a game engine. But what the potential of this kind of solution is that you can directly capture you know, your world with six degrees of freedom and then move around and see it in real time. <clears throat> Here are some examples where you have the ability to also manipulate lighting. And so this is the, all the manipulation is happening in real time. And you can, you can also, you know, incorporate traditional CG elements with these scenes and render them as well. Right? So there's nothing that prevents you from manipulating that. You can basically see how your, um, you can cut your scene and see how it looks like inside. So it's really nice for volumetric uh, views. So it's not just like the outside surface. And, um, you know, you can see like proper, you know, occlusion representations with CG elements. And what's really powerful is that you have the ability to basically render real world scenes, right? So we have this conference room, this flower structure, uh, this museum scene that is represented in real time and also has six degree of freedom, of course, uh, depending on um, you know, what has been captured uh, in the first place. So yeah, so I invite you to uh, check out uh, this uh, paper. Um, so this paper you can, go on alexu.net uh, slash planoptries. Um, the entire code is there and uh, you can also, there's also a real-time viewer 
So you don't even need a powerful machine. You don't even need a GPU to render it. That's really the beauty of it because um, you know, all the rendering can be done, uh, all the computation can be done in CPU. So you can basically just um, download the assets and uh, you know, see these nerf renderings uh, in real time. Okay, so with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and then uh, open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Thank you for um, a really interesting talk. Um, we've had uh, a few questions come in on uh, through the YouTube, uh, through the YouTube chat. Um, and if uh, anyone has questions, please uh, get them in now. Uh, so the first question was around uh, temporal consistency of um, the face reconstruction results that you showed. Um, and they said, uh, from the results, it looks like there isn't, there's a lack of temporal consistency from one frame to another. Um, That's right. And if you had uh, any comments about, about it and how, how it could be incorporated into, into your work. Right. So um, that specific reconstruction, I mean, um, so um, the, um, so it's true, right? So ideally you'd like to have like the perfect avatar that is completely consistent. Um, I think it's really hard to achieve that because if your input changes significantly, then um, it's hard to infer, you know, exactly the same content from that input. Um, but that the goal wasn't actually to show that, you know, temporal co coherency wasn't really the objective there. Uh, it's basically to show that even if we had a video of someone, um, that it generates plausibly similar uh, output frames. So, I mean, the goal isn't really, I mean, the goal is just to generate a person from a single photo. Uh, that's what um, this project is about. But then um, the ability to show that it generates plausible, consistent uh, avatars is sort of like, um, you know, a nice result of it, right? So, but, it's true, right? So ideally, but there is no reason for us to try to enforce it to be temporally coherent uh, because our input is just a single input image. That was sort of like more of an evaluation process. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there was also another question around the al albedo and the illumination, how it, um, disentangling them from that, that video, I, I got those reconstructions. Um, yeah. And yeah, so- What are your kind of thoughts in direction? Yeah, so the nice thing about the, um, so the disentanglement of the albedo and the lighting. Um, so it's, the nice thing is that it's not done explicitly. So it's done implicitly. So basically what our normalization inference does is that regardless of what lighting you have, it just generates this, um, this, uh, this diffuse lighting, right? This is what's, the network is being trained on. Um, and um, in order to make this work, we did have to have, uh, you know, a form of augmentation of the training data so that it has the ability to handle um, various lighting conditions. Are you still there? Uh, uh, I think we've lost Marco. Sorry, uh, how, <laughs> sorry for jumping in. I was just uh, sc screening the uh, Zoom call. Uh, I think we've lost Marco here. Uh, Marco, are you back? Uh, okay, Marco uh, is not here. Uh, let me carry on, right? We have more questions. It's, look, okay. it's good to have people uh, as a backup. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so there's a question for you from YouTube as well. So if you could have or invent one customer device for easy uh, but high quality photorealistic face reconstruction, what would that device look like hardware wise? Okay, so if you, if you could have or invent one customer device for easy but high quality photorealistic face reconstruction, how would it look? Hmm. Um... Like, I, I guess, I guess, I guess, um, uh, domestic or, or um, like non-expert users, 
are, yeah. are limited by, by, you know, the webcam that we have, right? And I understand that, especially when I talk to non-expert users, they're like, oh, what cameras are you guys using or what cameras do you expect people to have, right? So, yeah. so um, and, and the same goes for, for, for these devices for VR that I see that are out there, right? That you showed a few on, on your, on your, um, on your um, slide deck, right? Uh, so, so which which ones would we will we end up using, right? Because some of them are like too thick or too or too hard to get. So, in terms of oh, okay. construction, but also I think people are concerned about like the what devices we end we will end up using ideally. Mm. So, for capturing the person's face, I still believe that whatever camera is the way to go, um, and that's um, simply because they are everywhere, right? And mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we can see is that <clears throat> the dependency on depth sensors is also, you know, going down, right? So if you look at how hardware manufacturers are building their cameras, I mean, I mean, Apple has like a depth sensor in it, uh, but it's not, you don't have it for the world facing view, right? So um, I think that's, you know, just pure RGB cameras are still important. And also because algorithmically things are developing uh, so fast that you'll get very, very accurate estimation from just um, 2D inputs. Mm -hmm. Now for headsets, um, I, I think that's existing uh, hard, like existing AR and VR devices, they are like headsets, they are still very, I mean, they're limited. Um, I mean, obviously because they're bulky, you know, it's not mm -hmm. something that everyone will wear. We'll have to see how, mm -hmm they become you know, lighter and better. Uh, but what's important is to see how they can be made lighter and better, right? So there are some new kinds of OLED uh, displays that are going to be important. Um, uh, so new kinds of OLED technologies. Uh, and um, there's also a lot of other factors, like you know, how, much, how much power they consume, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. et cetera, and also price. So yeah. one of the things that I think was interesting is that, you know, the Oculus Quest Two is a is an interesting, um, is an interesting study where uh, you can see that because the price is down to three hundred dollars uh, per device, the adoption is much higher, right? So that mm -hmm. really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess like my my personal take on this is that I think at some point in your talk you said that in the next five to ten years we will see AR and VR really taking off um, but I, I also see I mean I have concerns about the if hardware will be there right uh, because for me to for AR to VR to take off it, that means is beyond what Oculus Quest can do and the new snap glasses sure. and all the glasses you've showed right so sure. I, I, um, as a I mean here we are mostly vision and graphics uh, people uh, and none of it's not common for us to have a hardware background, right? So we don't know we don't know too much about about hardware. So at some point, I, I'm um, I have this I, I hesitate a bit about this because it, it as a vision community we're we're really uh, uh, exponentially you know um, uh, growing. But I mean I don't see my non technical friends wearing or using AR or VR until we get like a glasses like these ones that are really useful and then. I don't know if you have experience on, on or, or thoughts about, yeah, really, if, if hardware will be there, like, you know, if, if, if the, the hardware that we need is going, is going to be there. I, I agree with you. I think uh, it, the hardware has to be there in order for mass adoption. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a condition. I don't think yeah. the hardware in five to 10 years, I mean, I think, so it's going to be in stages. I think what's going to happen is like, for example, in five years, I think the in the gaming space you'll have much more adoption first in mm -hmm. terms of that's yeah. going to be people who use it for one hour at most per per day right mm -hmm. uh, that use it in VR you'll have slightly better ones and I think in ten years that's sort of like the time where it's going to get you know better and you have a lot more adoption um, but why I still think this is important because this will increase the needs for whatever we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Because right now, what we're doing is we're creating technologies that allows us to create content easier, technologies that allows us to create virtual humans better. Um, but then the use is still, you know, in video games or in some, you know, 3D apps, but it's not entirely what we're seeing yet in terms of like what's, you know, these concept videos I was showing in the very beginning. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I I agree with that. Like, uh, um, we have to see, but the hardware needs to be there. I think, and and it's some, sometimes it's overlooked, or at least for for some people, uh, I believe it's a bit overlooked. But um, I I agree that all the steps we take are are, are really necessary. Um, okay, I think Marco is back online. Uh, I don't know if there's more questions. Sorry, I just jumped into to kind of uh, thank you for, continue thank you for the session. saving me, Dan. It's yeah, no problem. Hopefully in 10 years, we can have uh, Wi-Fi that doesn't constantly yeah. crash. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Wi-Fi and PowerPoint that do not crash, that's I look forward. <laughs> um, there's, there's one final question that came in on, on um, YouTube, which was, does the Plenoc Plenoc tree representation have an advantage in image quality over state-of-the-art conventional CG representations besides optimization-friendly characteristics? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, here's one example. If you want to represent something like... Uh, if you want... So the examples I was showing, um, I mean, many of them you can also represent using a traditional CG. But let me show. Let me give you a few examples. So let's say you want to have a scene with a car, and in the car you have like your your windshield, and you basically see all these like complex transparencies with the inside. So if you wanted to have a proper CG representation of that, you have to build all the assets. You have to create a shader for that. Another example is let's say you want to render fire, right? So you have you create or smoke, right? So for smoke you. I mean, first of all, for real-time rendering, you're limited by whatever particle effect you you have. Uh, but if you want to create something really complex, you can do pretty much anything in VFX nowadays. But the question is, you need to create the assets and the rendering time is prohibitive. Now there, it's just like, you don't have to think about anything. You just represent whatever there is and it just rendered. And it just looks like what it is, right? So it's literally like how you film something in 3D. And... Um, so basically the ability to have a unified framework for capturing, representing and rendering is really, really, um, it's really um, valuable because you don't have, you don't have to specify what is what. The only thing that you don't have is control, right? You, you can't, I mean, you can control lighting, but you can't say, well, remove that one, part of the thing, right? So, because it doesn't have any knowledge of like what is what, but it does represent the scene as it is. I think you're frozen. Again. So, <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for your, your, your wonderful talk. Um, and we're now gonna move on to the panel discussion, which you're very welcome to, to stick around for. Um, so at this point, I'll hand over to Christian Richard, who will um, chair the panel session. Hi, thank you very much, Hao. And I really like all the fascinating discussion that we've already had uh, throughout the workshop. I would now like to encourage everybody to switch on the cameras uh, to join the panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, the keynote speakers here, some other organizers and presenters from the papers. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so let's start uh, maybe with a quick round of reintroductions for those who just joined uh, the stream online. Uh, let's start with an uh, introduction of the organizers and the keynote speakers and then the paper presenters. Uh, so I'm Christian Richard, I'm an associate professor at the University of Bath, where I work on VR photography and VR video. Um, Marco? Yeah, I'm Marco Bellino. Um, I'm a research fellow at the University of Surrey, um, and my uh, research has been around uh, capturing dynamic scenes uh, for VR and AR applications. Michael? Um, hi, I'm Michael Sonhofer. Um, I'm a research scientist at Facebook Reality Labs in Pittsburgh, um, where I lead a group working on virtual telepresence. Um, Dan? Yes, hi, I'm Dan Casas from uh, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid. I work mostly on 3D reconstruction for digital humans and lately uh, about uh, modeling the deformation of 3D digital garments. We just uh, heard from Hao from a previous keynote. Uh, the other keynote speaker here today was uh, Lourdes Agapito. Yes, hi, I'm Lourdes Agapito. I'm, uh, Professor of 3D Computer Vision at uh, University College London, 
um, and also co-founder of Synthesia. Thank you. Akin? Hi everyone, I'm Akin. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Surrey, CUSSP, and I'm working on 3D human reconstruction and 3D, I mean, avatar generation. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Jack? Uh, uh, hi, I'm a graduate from Shanghai Tech University, and I was uh, interested, I, I am interested in computer graphics and uh, 3D uh, dynamics in 3D reconstruction. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kaisuke? Hi, I'm Keisuke Shibata. I'm from Kyoto University, Japan. I'm interested in dynamic human reconstruction. Thank you. And I hope I have not missed anyone. Fantastic. Let's get started. So last year, this discussion started with the observation that a lot of the contributions to the workshop were about humans. And humans are fascinating. I'm sure you're, uh, you're agreeing. Um, but the, the world is so much more dynamic and so much more vibrant. Uh, so what um, What's still missing? How far are we from achieving general dynamic scene reconstruction? Who would like to go first? Maybe how? Sure. <laughs> how far are we from general dynamic scene reconstruction? Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting observation where you say there's a lot of interest in humans. I think, uh, I've been thinking about this as well, right? So what are things that are dynamic that uh, research should focus on? And I think one thing about humans is that they are the deforming part of you know, humans, animals. But if you think about it, there isn't actually much other things that are deforming surfaces, right? So humans are very, but, and also you know, we're at the center of our, our world. So, um, but then I think the other part is, you know, rigid and static things um, are, you know, Kind of like um, similar, but then the question is, how do you go to something a lot more general? And I think you know some of the the, the final things that I was showing on you know things like nerves and all that that stuff. Um, this is where we're looking at. I mean, the stuff I was showing is still static, right? It's a real time rendering where you can show how you can uh, you know digitize entire scenes. Um, I think Facebook Reality Labs. Um, and uh, I think Michelle has been also working on a, a couple of work where you have dynamic uh, representations uh, using very similar um, representations. I think the question is, um, <clears throat> if you think about dynamic scenes in general, it means that you don't care about, you don't want a system that is ad hoc to humans, ad hoc to cars or ad hoc to this. You want something that just, absorbs an entire scene and has the ability to represent that and also render it. So then you do need a very, very general approach. Um, the anything before all these neural implicit you know, representations, we always assume that it's like a 3D textured model, um, things that we use in traditional computer graphics. And just by definition, the traditional computer graphics approach is very, very complex. It has a lot of advantages and everyone is using that. But if you need something more general, I think this implicit representation is, is really important. I think to answer your question, I think we're only at the very beginning of that because if you look at all these volumetric representations, of, those are probably the first kinds of things that you know probably introduced like two or three years ago. Um, we're sort of like the first direction where we start to think about, uh, well, you know, let's just have this like universal representation of something, have the ability to render that from different views and then see if we can encode something independently of materials, appearance, et cetera. And um, one thing that I think I can also observe is that there's an explosion in that. I mean, just. You know, we, we introduced something with real time, but there's probably two, three other papers that are doing real time using a slightly different approach, but it just shows how this field is really, really, um, you know, exploding. And there's a lot of applications that are just waiting for a solution for that. One of the challenges though, that I see is um, how would you represent, oh, I was, I went to a workshop a couple of years ago and I think Richard Newcomb gave, gave a talk and I thought it was really interesting because he was like, 
I know we have this vision that's, you know, Oculus that we want to digitize everything, right? It's pretty much like, how do you go from a multi-view stereo reconstruction like Google Earth of everything, but encode time into it? That I think, that I think is the other aspect of it. Like what do you, I mean, it's so much more than in terms of complexity to have the ability to encode dynamics, like where are the cars, where are the people walking around? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at this point we have very select scenes that we can handle, but what if you ever want to go like into an entire world that is being somehow encoded? Uh, that would be really exciting, I think. Yeah, ma 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 just to jump in on this. So um, if, you if we look at the, uh, at the limited uh, version of general dynamics, I see that, for example, in the case of humans, there's this trend of model-based and model-free, right? There's people who are using simple model or whatever parametric model to try to reconstruct humans. And then there is the implicit or model-free uh, reconstruction of humans. But now there's a few works that uh, try to merge both. Because if you don't merge both, you don't have enough expressivity in your, in your parametric model, right? So, right. um, so maybe in the end, uh, I mean, here in this panel, I see people with many works on model-based and, and, and people with works on model-free, right? <laughs> I can, I can. So, um, but I think clearly none of the two methods gives you everything, right? And uh, for the case of specific of humans, I see works that are try to merge, no? So maybe for the super general case, we need some sort of, uh, I, think, I think we had the similar questions at the end of Lourdes talk when we had this crazy image where there was people on a, on a very busy market buying stuff and, and it was a super crowded scene. And then Lourdes gave this uh, hint about, well, maybe you need some graph representation to you know, uh, you know, split, uh, split the scene into different stuff, whatever this stuff is. And then each of these blocks, you can, you can, you can uh, do something with it individually. No? So maybe, um, you know, some sort of classification uh, or, you know, split the problem into small pieces. And then some of these pieces are model-based or model-free. Uh, maybe it's one of the steps. Uh, and it doesn't have to be either or, right? I think yeah. the hybrid, you know, we were showing with, you know, this pagan approach that hybrid is a important approach because you have sort of like the best of both worlds. And I think this recent work from uh, Dudley and Colton's lab at Intel also shows, you know, it, you know, they're making this GTA scenes look like for the real. It's another way of saying that, you know, you have, you divide, you, you have this like model representation, classical model representation combined with a photo real filter, right? Yeah, maybe, oh, sorry, please Lotus, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just want to give it a slightly different different spin. And, and going back to Chris' question, um, like why, why do we get like mainly submissions about like humans kind of? I, I think if we boil it down, like we humans are just pretty interested in ourselves and modeling ourselves. Um, so like the, the research field has made their homework over the last 10 to 20 years on that. And we, we've collected the right data sets. We, we solve the low level vision tasks for these types of problems. Like we have landmark detectors that are really powerful. We have these um, blend shape models, uh, Basel face model, these human models like simple. We, we have all of that already and we can now use it in these learning tasks. So, so I think we are kind of standing on the shoulders of giants and of the generations before us. Um, but I don't, don't think there's anything different for general dynamic scenes. Like we could pick any dynamic thing in the world. And if we would make our homework correctly, we could like track and reconstruct it. Like if we had a landmark detector for cats and dogs and other animals, that, that would all work. We, we just didn't make our homework yet. Um, I, I think the real problem is like, if you want to model all different classes of objects at the same time, and, and there it becomes really challenging. It, it becomes a sheer data problem. Like how would you, how would your training set look like if you wanted to model any object in the world. It's, it's, it's like exponentially many objects and like materials and illumination conditions and all of that comes together. So it's really challenging. So I think data, data and making our homework, basically collecting the right data sets and then developing, solving these low level vision tasks on them first so we can use them to initialize our models to have like um, sparse supervision at least and, and all of that. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I also think that 
perhaps the more the most interesting question is you know how do we capture this data as well and how do we annotate the data so you know we were saying before um, I mean, for, for the simple model, for instance, you know, there were so many scans, they scanned, you know, thousands of people, then there was probably months or, or years of work of aligning everything. And, you know, out came this incredible model, super powerful that now everybody's using. Um, and I think that going through the effort of doing that for cats and dogs and, you know, absolutely everything, <laughs> um, in some ways that that, that, that would be one way of going about things but the other you know what, what I think is is really exciting and I think we we're starting to to walk in that direction is can we can we actually do this directly from images and, and from video um, that's not annotated with with 3D and I, and I think that we, we're starting to we are starting to really move in that direction um, and you know all this this work on on neural rendering while you're also learning uh, embedding spaces simultaneously that can become more and more meaningful so that then you can edit as well you know it, it's it's really a it's really a direction that that's that's starting to get starting to get momentum right but um but it's true that you know then you come back and you take a step back and you think uh any any scene you look at you know you it, it's way too complex for us to actually rep to to really um understand it fully in in 3d right now um and and i i think that we we do have to use all the power of you know there's there's been so much work in 2d recognition as well that i think that that's something that we definitely need to exploit you know all the all the annotations that, that, that exist in 2D, pushing them into our 3D models. I think that's really important so that then we can start, you know, understanding the scene at the level of objects um, and, and, and building representations that are really uh, also have semantic uh, information. That is uh, touching on a lot of questions already put down on my list. So the next one is we already uh, discussed NERF a few times uh, throughout the workshop uh, and we've seen tremendous progress in that area. I mean, there's dozens of NERF papers now out, even dynamic NERF papers. Uh, so the question I have to the panel is, uh, will NERF take over the world? Will it kill off all the traditional approaches? I think what I what I tried to argue during, during my talk is that it's a very traditional approach. <laughs> I mean, you know, for me, it's multi-view stereo. That's it. It's just that the way in which you represent the scene is 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 completely novel. You know, you you use a neural network to represent the properties of three D points rather than just okay, I'm going to represent mm -hmm. the three D coordinates or I'm going to represent a, as a voxel or whatever. Um, but but the the driving the driving force behind it is 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 actually very traditional, and I I find that very I find that very interesting because in some ways it tells us we we have actually got many things right, um, it, you know, and 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 we're building as uh, Michael said before, you know, we're building on the shoulders of of giants all these. Um, lots of people working working in this area and I think that now we we just need to you know we need to make our models more more flexible um how do we deal with the case when our cameras are not perfectly calibrated you know can we then you know also refine the the the, the, the camera pose uh can we deal with transient uh, effects can we deal with different lighting can we you know all of those things I think that's where the exciting part of, yeah, you know, using neural networks for this and being able to learn from data opens up that, that potential of you, you don't have to model everything. <laughs> you can learn a lot of things from, from data. Um, but the things that we know how to model in the case of NERF, you know, multi-view consistency and all of that, you know, great. Um, uh, and, and then let, let's learn. I think for me, that's what NERF has, has uh, has put forward to our field, you know, it's like what what we know how to model, just just you know, do it that way, uh, do it model based, uh, geometry based, uh, use the geometry as much as possible, and then what you can't explain, then yeah, you know, to learn it from data. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. my, my take on, on Nerf is um, that in the end, I, I see many Nerf papers, but in the end, uh, they are all overfitted to the training data, right? So, uh, so in, in reality, uh, they do not generalize to anything, at least from my point of view. It's like, okay, they look really good. And it's true that it's, it's uh, very highly efficient if you can implement it in a neural network, you can sort of GPU, there's many tricks to speed them up, et cetera, et cetera. But the, in the end, it's reconstruction. It's, it's reconstruction of one scene, and in some cases, a tiny dynamic effect. Let me call it tiny dynamic because, I mean, uh, we, as, a, as, a, as a engineers and a researchers, we know how to model physics. We know how to model how super highly dynamic uh, uh, surfaces deform. But I don't see any of that in, in the nerve. So, uh, so, so uh, explicit uh, models that are studied for centuries <laughs> on how objects deform and how, how light reflects the surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. All these, we have this knowledge like for many, for many years ago, right? And none of this is in this nerve and maybe a tiny bit. Yeah, there's maybe some nerve that they have a, a, a term that is use of explicit uh, reflectance based on the normal. But I mean, I think that's a, just a tiny bit of knowledge that what we have. Anything else I think is a brute force. So uh, um, uh, with Lourdes, we also discuss about nerf for humans. And it's actually nowhere. I mean, there, there's a few papers, but it's, this is, uh, I, I think this is so beyond what explicit humans model can do, right? Um, and uh, humans as a, we have a lot of people doing super fancy research on rendering of humans, subsurface scattering, crazy stuff that, that, that I see like, whoa, whoa, what is this? And, and none of this is in this nerf and I don't see it coming around. So to me it's limited, uh, of course they just appeared like two or three years ago and it's taking off, right? So maybe in one year <laughs> uh, we are there, right? But to me so far it's, it's just tricks to exploit, uh, to, to interpolate data nicely. I don't see more than that at this point. That's my, that's my take on nerf, but I'm the only one not working in nerf here either. So <laughs> I would be happy to change my, my mind. Yeah, I kind of you like could give Jack a, uh, an opportunity to defend this. Oh, <laughs> defend uh, yes, paper. so uh, in my opinion, I think NERF is uh, simply recording the 3D thing by the multi-view uh, uh, constraints, yes. Um, but um, uh, there are also some uh, works are trying to uh, generalize uh, NERF into um, um, Every every 3D thing like uh, IBR night and uh, it's a I think it's pretty good uh, using transformer to uh, generalize a 3D thing. Uh, uh, it's pre-trained by multiple 3D things. So uh, I think the basic idea, uh, the key ideas of the uh, IBR night is uh, it use uh, transformers to extract uh, the uh, features from images is uh, is learning to understand the 3D thing, but not just to record the 3D thing. So I think uh, maybe the a more general um, pipeline to uh, use explicit representation to represent the 3D thing is uh, uh, try to light the network to understand the 3D thing. How to uh, like uh, uh, use SIFT to extract, uh, instead of use SIFT to extract the uh, feature from images, we use uh, uh, maybe you use neural network to extract uh, deep uh, features for each three, uh, of, for different images and pairing them to get the final blended image. So um, maybe I think uh, you use neural network to um, understand the 3D so maybe a general solution yes yeah i also wanted to i wanted to add one one thing and defend the nerves a bit maybe um and and, and i was just being critical just to you know warm yeah, yeah. up a little bit about um, here, right? no i know i know and i know where you're coming from and i think you're totally right in in, in that direction and um, that we want to integrate more um knowledge we have about physics and so on um I, I think in my mind, NERF, um, when, it, when it came out, it did, did one thing really, really well, basically. And it, it gives these stunning high quality results for view synthesis. Um, and the beauty about it is it's, it's, it's pretty simple in a way, like the model, it's really easy to adapt. This is why we see such a huge amount of papers right now. It's, it's really easy, like it's this MLP model, like with PyTorch or TensorFlow, you can like, that's a few lines of code, like, like you can easily adopt that. So I think that's why a lot of people are using it. And 
went a bit for maybe low hanging fruits in the beginning where you just out of the box, you use it. Um, but what we see right now is also in the, in the newer papers, like people already are combining it with the classical methods. You, we have like a nerve on top of simple, a nerve of, on top of a skeleton, um, and like nerves that have some explicit reasoning about like that light transport is maybe linear, for example, like that you could like, um, and, and, and stuff like that. And, and I think we will see more of that in the, in the future, like this combination, and it will converge to a hybrid at some point, I feel. Um, and at, at which threshold this hybrid is, like how much is it neural, how much is it classic? I, I think it depends on the availability of data. Again, I have to go back to training data. I'm really sorry that I'm always the one bringing up training data, but I think the more data you have, well, the more you can just, just learn it from the data. So if, if I give you like millions over millions of images, yeah, maybe you can just train your neural models and you don't have to care about modeling 3D at all. But if I give you a limited set of data, then you want to use these priors and that knowledge about 3D that you have. And um, I think where that threshold is, is de determined by how much data you have in a way. And we will explore that probably over the next one or two. Yeah, like in, at, fa at Facebook Reality Lab, you have a lot of data, right? So it's, it's good to... Uh... Yeah, but um, exactly. But even so, we have a lot of data. We explicitly try to build 3D constraints in the yeah, models yeah, yeah, because yeah. It, it helps generalization a lot. Um, yeah. So, so I personally believe that if you, um, if you can model something really correctly, like let's say a camera model, we, we really accurately know how to do that. We should build that into the neural network. Um, but then sometimes there's something we don't really know how to model. Um, let, let's say we, we, we come up with like, oh, we don't know about the illumination. So let's use spherical harmonics, for example, to model illumination. Then we already have the trade-off of like, oh, it's low frequency, for example. So maybe it's not a good thing to put that into the, like into the approach, but we need to do it for a monocular approach because otherwise it's too under-constrained. So it's like, how much data do we have and, and how do we put these things together, ideally, I feel. Okay, so uh, my take on if nerfs are going to take over the world, I think no. <laughs> I, think, I think the reason is because I think it's not a generator. Uh, it's not something like um, StyleGAN that you can, you know, sort of like generalize to other things. I think it's going to be, it will evolve into something like that. Um, but I think the main reason is that it's, I mean, it's an interesting and very effective, I think as you, you probably all agree, that I think it's a very effective way of encoding something. And it's, uh, you know, encoding entire scenes. And um, there's definitely some hype around it. Um, but I think, I don't think the, I think the main missing component is the, the generator part. I think that is something that uh, is going to be, um, has to come next. Um, yeah. I mean, in the end, what you want is this. You want to have, I take a picture of a room and it generates the entire room. For you. That's what you want. And that right now, I think it also kind of is consistent with what uh, Lourdes is saying which is, it's, it's, it's pretty much like multi-view, like, like multi-view stereo plus plus with a view dependency. Um, the other thing that I'm, I also think, uh, and that's something that when we did the, you know, our work on planoc trees, uh, and <clears throat> we're, we're looking that into it right now is, um, the kind of data that are used are kind of limited. Everyone is using the same data. Uh, for, <laughs> so there's not a good understanding of, how good it works. We've done some tests with some other kinds of scenes and there's some stuff that are kind of interesting. So um, I think I mentioned a little bit before like volumetric things. So it's very good actually for you know things like cloud and those kind of scenes. Um, but, uh, and you've never seen, you almost never see any of those kind of data in papers. So um, I think there's also some uh, research that's going to happen on like what kind of stuff we can actually render. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like my take. Maybe quickly to piggyback on that, uh, because that's a really interesting point how I brought up about these data sets. They, they seem all quite diffuse. I mean, they, they have some specularities, but like it's more like low frequency. And NERF has this like, like there are two ways of modeling view dependence in NERF basically. Well, one is the view conditioning the network gets, but then you are aggregating samples along a array. Right. So it depends on like where your array is going in 3D, you will pick up different samples and blend them differently together. So right. there's always a way of like cheating by 
putting something behind something else. Like let's say you have a you would have a mirror in the room. Right. It, it could try to model that now with view dependence with like a single MLP in the end of right. the network, or right. actually like creating a mirrored scene behind the mirror. And um, I think we don't talk a lot about this because we have, we just look at these data sets that are out there and it's just not the case. Right. I think I, I just want to add one more thing that I think makes Nerf very, very interesting and powerful, which is the, 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 the low memory that it, that it requires. I think for, for me, that, that's, a very, that's a very, very, very interesting thing. Um, because if you, you know, if you think about, um, I mean, what how we was talking about before, right? Um, using these things in, in real time, being able to, uh, I don't know, transmit these things in real time. If, you, if you're trying to get two people to talk to each other with some kind of um, 3D visualization, I mean, you know, for sharing the scenes, for robotics, for, for these kind of applications, it's, it's, it is actually incredibly good to have this very, very small uh, memory footprint. And I think that that's something that will make it quite attractive for a long time. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I also want to give some ex, ex, uh, interesting uh, re, experience results based on your uh, observation that uh, NERF have, uh, have a, a low memory requirement. And uh, uh, in fact, if you uh, generate a 3D thing with all the noisy uh, 3D point, uh, and you're trying to use uh, um, MLP based uh, technique to um, overfit uh, to a, 3D, a noisy 3D uh, point cloud, uh, it will fail, which means uh, maybe the natural thing is. Uh, um, is low ranked so that we can learn a uh, latent code or some param parameters to overfit into a 3D thing. But if the 3D thing is uh, uh, totally noisy, in fact, uh, the MLP cannot overfit into the 3D thing. Yeah, it's uh, an experiment result uh, I have done. Thanks. Yeah, maybe just to bring uh, the, the YouTube chat into the panel, which we should keep an eye if you want to uh, really listen to others. Um, Umar Iqbal, I apologize for the mostly likely bad pronunciation, says, how about if we look NERF as a photorealistic alternative to traditional 3D assets? I think he, he's thinking about like, instead of buying you know a mesh with a texture, you buy a, a function of, of the of the nerve of this object, I think it's an interesting. I can see a um, um, some some digital market at some point selling nerve of objects. That that's maybe there's some business idea right there. So <laughs> it's interesting to see like an overfitted function to an object. That's 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 uh, why not right? Nerf NFT. Yeah, exactly. You you sell nerve, right? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Howard Michael already brought up the, the issue of, of data sets. Uh, so I was wondering, um, that's probably a very broad question, but uh, what would the ideal data set look like to you? Uh, what would it contain? How big would it be? And what would it measure? And maybe we can pose this question uh, to our paper authors first. Uh, maybe Akin, I don't know if you have thoughts on this. Uh, yes, actually, it was a really good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, please, actually, one of in our, in one of our work actually we worked on the synthetic data generation. Uh, it was synthetic, yes. We tried to increase the photorealism or realistic rendering in our data. First of all, it is one of the things uh, we should satisfy in in any data set. So, for example, in render people data set, which is uh, used quite actually uh, in all of it, how can it for example Python use it or Python HD use it in the previous works, but how can I say it is not accessible uh, by all, all all the researchers? So there should be, for me actually, there should be some something in between them. We should access the data set. We should be able to generate the data set in our uh, for our problem, because we cannot generalize all the scenes. Okay, we can increase the, we can increase, the, we can augment the data, but what I observed during the data set generation, uh, there is no limit. Sky is the limit. I mean, you can play with the lightning, you can play with the texture, but there is no limitation. So what I think is that we should come up with some kind of a framework 
somehow people can generate their data set, at least to try their hypothesis. Uh, actually, in our data set, 3 dvh data set, uh, we have some tools available, some commercial tools, but we uh, use them in the research purposes. But from that tiny uh, framework, actually, we generated six different papers. Okay. And those papers were in different areas, like some of them reconstruction, some of them were lightning, but the different researchers use different parts of it. To be honest, I really like this idea because we are in the research, what we are doing is we are, uh, we have some hypothesis and we try to say, justify them or we are going to see that they don't work. <laughs> That's the thing. So what I believe in the data set, especially in the research, it should be, they should be accessible and they sh we should have some frameworks to generate our own data set easily uh, because it takes time. And sometimes we have very basic idea and we want to try it with, for example, Michael just uh, gave an example. For, for example, you can just easily uh, use PyTorch Nerf implementation in a minute, like five or six lines of code, but some, you need data. Hmm. So I don't want to spend lots of, a lot of time actually to create data. This was my motivation when I was creating this framework. So I'm still actually um, following this motivation. Right now we have version six, for example, in our data set generation. It takes like seconds to generate uh, hundreds of rendering, hundreds of models in, the, in a, a very small amount of time. So we can try it. This is one of the things. And the second thing is, yes, photorealism, because it's really important. At this point, what I believe is that, okay, we can capture real scenes, but it, in terms of the uh, time consumption and money actually we need, uh, they are not possible. Okay, thanks to, for example, render people or other commercial uh, sources so we can buy from them, but it's not the solution. This is my opinion. I don't know if you are if you agree or not. Uh, so we have, have to find some solution in a synthetic way. And because, okay, we are doing some computer vision research. It is growing or it's improving but also synthetic rendering frameworks are also improving. So why don't we use them? So it is my opinion. I don't want to just take your time. Maybe I can uh, just give my, give this, give my uh, take the, I mean, anyone can take the stage. So, I don't know what you think about the synthetic data. And I think it sounds very, very flexible, very powerful. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, Kaisuka maybe has something to add. What, what are you missing from your data sets uh, that you would like to see in an ideal data set? Uh, uh, for example, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, video data is uh, now uh, uh, more and more available. Uh, uh, I I found uh, research using TikTok data uh, uh, and using temporal consistency as a regularization. Uh, I, I think uh, video data can be collected easily and, and it is useful to learn uh, uh, photorealistic reconstruction. I also want to add something here. For example, uh, speaking of the static data, this is one thing actually, uh, it's not easy to generate this synthetic data. Uh, the, how can I say physical deformation? Some wrinkles, so that it is still a problem. Uh, it was one of my problem. I just want to add it to my <laughs> actual comment on the data set generation. Maybe Dan can uh, say something but, about wrinkles. I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. no, 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 they are not. <laughs> they should be consistent <laughs> <laughs> in real life. There should be some wrinkles. I mean, if you want to have some real data. But you're right, I, mean, <laughs> I can't, <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Thank you, Akin. Thanks. What are you missing, Michael? I guess the data set stuff is for Michael, right? I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think like Akin had a good point, like the sky is the limit there. Like if you think of the, the whole world, like we, we are far from having the data we, we want. Um, and like if, if we have a data set, we want more probably, um, but, but there, there are physical limitations to it, which, which make it challenging, I think, to use real data. Like there is just no way to capture what we want actually. Like if you think, think of what you want to capture, let's say just for a human, you, you want the geometry, you, you want the appearance maybe of different humans. You want to observe the human under different illumination conditions. Yes. Like 
there's no physical setup which could give you dense measurements of that. Like if you, even if you have a multi-camera, multi-light system, like you have to time multiplex at some point, like you, you will not have observed every expression under every illumination. So like, it's really hard to, to measure that tensor kind of like densely in a way, even if you had all the money you, you, you want, like there are some physical limits to it, um, which on the other hand, like points a bit at synthetic data. But then there you have like always the domain gap and it's really hard to, to get the fidelity you want. So um, yeah, it's, it's challenging. Um, and we, I think we will have a job for the next five to 10 years at least before that is solved. Excellent, thank you. This is really a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time. Uh, I would like to uh, lead over to the uh, closing comments if anybody would like to add uh, their thoughts uh, that they have right now or anything else they would like to say. Maybe we can start with how. Um, okay. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, the... Um, uh, I, I, so I think the question, I mean, it, that we had at the very beginning of this uh, panel session, uh, which is, uh, you know, how we're we seeing uh, dynamic scene reconstruction um, evolving. I think one one of the question is, you know, what what have we learned from this workshop, and what what are what are the trends that we're seeing, right? So we're we're seeing a couple of trends, right? So still a strong interest in humans. Uh, strong interest in digitizing entire worlds. How do we encode them? So it basically almost like includes everything about what people are doing in computer vision. But there are also some interesting things that I think came out of this, um, this panel discussion, which is um, do, what do we see in terms of like, uh, you know, things like neural representation or rendering, right? So uh, what, what is it that we think uh, it's going and what are the kind of ideal data sets that we would like to have. Um, and <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> so I think we kind of already touched on like many of these important topics. And I think those kind of topics could be really valuable for, for example, if you're going to reorganize this thing for next year um, and uh, how we see things um, change. There is one other thing that I think um, we're not seeing that much is a lot of the problems that we're looking at are all like specifically whenever we go from 2D to 3D, re the resolution goes down drastically, right? If you look at Stargan 2, I don't know, like it's, what else do you want to improve? It's, it's almost perfect, right? So these humans that are generated, uh, like these 2D images, for instance, I mean, yeah, you can always fix these artifacts in there, but they always, they already, but the question is how can you gener generate 3D content at that kind of fidelity? So that I think <clears throat> is not only a question of capturing, but also in terms of like, what is actually the right way to represent those things so that you can generate these things. So we've seen like a lot of progress there as well, like cascaded networks that can generate more and more, um, but still it's a very challenging problem, right? So. Um, before, in the past, we were encoding, well, in the past, we're still encoding the entire world using textured surfaces, so it's still a two-manifold, but this volumetric representation is also very wasteful, right? So then there's a question of what is the right, you know, are, are there things that can improve the generation of these kind of contents that maybe it's it, it's something that we'll uh, be looking at very, you know, uh, we'll have more uh, topics on that, uh, you know, in the coming months and years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just to wrap up too, I mean, I agree that uh, I, I've been trying to play a little bit with, you know, autoencoders using meshes, convolutional meshes, convolutional graph. All, uh, there's a huge progress on, 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 on this aspect, but uh, at least the progress I've, uh, I've seen or I've been able to touch and play uh, myself and with my students, uh, it's 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 really hard there, right? Like the, in order to get a, a generative method of of high high resolution meshes, it's it's hard. Uh, it's not it's it's, it's way um, uh, way off uh, in comparison to StyleCan, for example. So I agree that that, that um, generative models for three representation 
despite all the progress in implicit representations and all the tricks with implicit representations to incorporate Fourier um, phase, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's, um, it's happening right now and it should happen uh, for over the next few uh, years. So I agree that, that getting a, a high resolution at 3D, uh, it's, just still, it's just still an ongoing. So it, it, every like month... With, and yeah. I like your comment before about... Sorry for interrupting. I like your uh, comment before on the hardware dependency, because everything we do now is kind of also limited by the hardware. You know, yeah. you can say, well, you know, we only have, I don't know, 24 gigabytes <laughs> in our GPU that we can't do more. That's the only thing we can do. What if you have like a, a terabyte? <laughs> it's, it's, so that's, that's different. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so absolutely. So hopefully in these directions, we, we, we really see it happening uh, in the next few years. And as how said, right, let's see if in the, uh, this is the third year we are able to organize this workshop. And I, I, I like it because uh, it, it's in dynamic general scenes uh, 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 as a wrap up, right? Because we don't get any submission about dynamic general scenes. <laughs> it's funny because we organize a, a, a workshop and we don't get any, any paper that fits well the topic of the workshop. We get, you know, pieces of dynamic general scenes. Uh, but if we, yeah, I, think, I think we're in the good track, right? If, if, no, if no one is doing it well, that means that uh, there's, there's a lot to do. So um, uh, we, I think we've touched many many aspects of uh, general uh, dynamic general scenes that are, are still not happening. But I, 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 I'm, I look forward to see the, the wrap up comments of the uh, other panelists. Maybe Michael? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to take too much time. I, I agree with almost everything that was said. Um, maybe, maybe just to add, like, I, I, I think we live in really exciting times right now. Like if, if you look what, how the field is progressing, how much um, advancements we have. And we are kind of between three different communities right now, graphics, vision, and machine learning. It's really exciting to be there. And I'm really looking forward to what we see over the next year or so. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have much more, much more to add either. Uh, may, maybe just, you know, go back to, uh, I, I still really, you know, it's a comment that Hal made before about, um, you know, the hardware. Uh, there, there was a question from somewhere on YouTube, you know, if you could design your uh, some some kind of hardware for, for capture, you know, what what would it be? And in the end, you know, I totally agree with what Hal said. It's like, you know, we all carry our phones. That 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 should be the way in which we we're capturing data if we can make it as flexible as possible to use you know, any, any possible image that we're taking, every, every time that we're taking photos of the world, that, that should contribute to like, you know, our computer vision data set um, to, to model general dynamic scenes. You know? And at the moment, yeah, we're, we're, still, we're, still not, we're still not quite doing that. You know? um, so I, yeah, I, I, I really think that we, we need to make it more and more easy to be able to use uh, in the wild data uh, as much as possible uh, to train to train our networks because that that's when we will really be able to understand fully the dynamic scenes right at the moment we're doing bit by bit because we're using very specialized ways in which we we capture our data and yeah, and, and I think this, you know, the, the idea of having this workshop is, is really great. So yeah, thank you very much to the organizers. Yeah, thanks. All right. Well, it clearly seems like we have our work cut out for ourselves for the uh, future. Yes, uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, we have discussed lots of challenges. Um, and I would like to thank all of you uh, for your contributions to this workshop. And I would now like to uh, lead over uh, to the closing and best paper award session. All right, yeah. thank you all. Thank you for the journey, the panel, uh, all the paper authors and how and Lourdes, uh, that went pretty well. So thank you for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Right, so now it's my great pleasure to uh, close the third Dynavis workshop uh, with the announcement of the best paper award. And the winner is...
consistent 3D human shape from repeatable action by Kaisuke Shibata, Sangyeon Lee, Shohei Nobuhara, and Konishino from Kyoto University and JST Presto. Congratulations. And now I would like to thank everybody uh, who made this workshop a success. I would like to thank all the workshop attendees, everybody who's watching a recording of this stream, everybody who submitted their work and presented their work here today. And a special warm thank you to our inspirational keynote speakers, Lourdes Agapito and Hao Li. And uh, I would also like to thank my workshop co-organizers, Marco, uh, Armin, Dan, myself, Michael, and Adrian Hilton. And with that, I would like to close the third international workshop on dynamic scene reconstruction at CVPR 2021. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you and bye-bye.